Batman Beyond has had many different comic book iterations, some that continued the original storyline and some that kind of reinvented it. During DC Rebirth, they came up with a new version of Batman Beyond, but this one did a great job. We spent 50 issues learning all about where all the other superheroes went and what happened in the world of Batman Beyond. So today we're gonna bring you Batman Beyond Rebirth, the entire full story. For Terry McGinnis, Neo-Gotham is his home. Even though things never change, there is one thing that did. Him becoming Batman. However, our story didn't just start with Terry kicking in a bus window to come stop the Joker's thugs and slam their heads into the ground before throwing them out of the window. It all started one night when him and Dana were confronted by the Joker's thugs and him jumping on a bike to lead them away. While they chased him, Terry McGinnis turned down an old road and he almost hit an old man. But that old man wasn't just anyone. He was Bruce Wayne. Bruce helped Terry take down the thugs and afterwards, he helped Bruce back into his house to help him get his medication. While sleeping from the meds, Terry happened to upon a strange clock, then behind it, discovered a staircase into a wondrous cave, one he realized belonged to the man Bruce Wayne, who was really Batman. Though not happy about Terry discovering his secret at first, Bruce coached him through taking down his father's killer. Back in the current times though, Terry brings down a bus full of children and he speaks with Commissioner Barbara Gordon about what happened. However, while talking to her, they begin to hear the Joker's thugs laughing, and then their mouths begin to foam up and they die. Terry says that it's the Joker Venom. Is it possible that the actual Joker is still around? And Barbara tells him that the Joker's been dead for years. Don't turn into Bruce Wayne pining on an old case. Elsewhere though, Dana walks with an officer to continue her work as a social worker. As they knock on a door to speak with Miss Ortiz, she tells them that they shouldn't have come. It isn't safe. Suddenly, an extendable boxing glove shoots out, knocking out the officer, and the two members of the Joker gang tell Dana that the woman was trying to say that this is Joker's town, and the boss won't tolerate their kind around here. Back with Terry, he and his brother Matt begin to unpack in their new apartment, while Matt tells him that it's so cool that he was saving those people. Terry says that it's cool that he's being back, and that he's lucky that Max was able to take care of things while he was gone. Matt tells him that if it wasn't for Spellbinder locking Terry down, he wouldn't have had to take care of himself, but what's important now is that Terry is back. As Terry and Matt joke, Max takes out her phone stating that she can't believe he's here. Dana, she's been taken by the Jokers! Terry suits up and he begins to head out, but as he goes, he begins to think about how him and Dana used to be close. But with Batman becoming a bigger thing in his life, she's become less important. While Spellbinder took him off the grid, everyone assumed that he was dead, and Dana moved on. So what is he supposed to say when he sees her? Hey, I'm back from the grave, and I'm Batman. But as Terry begins to ask where he can find the Jokers, a fist flies out, punching him, stating, You don't look fun. A giant member of the Joker's gang knocks Terry around and then begins to pull down the wall over him and begins to laugh. However, over in the No Laugh and Matter Club, Dana sits in a chair telling the man before her that she knows who he is. He is Carter Wilson and he tells her that that was his name as a child. Now, he goes by Terminal. She asks why he brought her here, and he tells her that it wasn't actually him. Someone else gave the order, the real man in charge. Terminal then points to a window stating that he's raising him from the dead, the Joker. Under a pile of bricks, the giant Joker thugs pull him down, and Terry tells himself, Big Batman was supposed to be fun, but now I can hardly breathe or move. Max tries to call out to him over the comms, but there's too much debris on top of him, and Terry can't even respond. The Joker thugs are beating him down, and that's the beginning of our story. Some of the Jokers start shouting to burn the pile with Batman in it. However, Terry has a new idea. With the little movement that he has in his hand, Terry begins to drop small explosive charges into a pipe next to him. As the charge makes its way into the ground, it explodes explodes, launching Terry out of the pile of bricks. Back over in the Batcave, Matt, his little brother, shouts that the signals are coming back live. They've got a clear picture now, so go get him, bro! The giant thug runs in swinging at Terry, but Terry says that he may not sport the whole Joker's thing, but as Terry punches the thug, he realizes it's like punching a brick wall. Terry then asks if he wouldn't hit a guy with glasses. The thug begins to punch him into a nearby truck, and Terry says, oh, I guess I'll take that as a yes. The thug continues to beat on Terry, and all Terry can do is think about how he's out of practice. This shouldn't be happening. The thug then walks over, picking Terry up and squeezing and breaking his ribs. He struggles for a little bit, but with not much success, so he takes out a pair of batarangs and cuts the tubes, feeding into the thug's muscles. With no juice left, the thug stumbles back, and Terry grabs a sewer lid to hit him. But then he hears more of the Joker's gang coming. They begin to chant, KILL THE BAT! And they swing their knives and their bats. Terry manages to fend off the attackers, but one cuts into the back of his shoulder. More and more thugs begin to crawl out, all grabbing and holding Terry down. In a desperate attempt to break free, Terry releases 
an electric shock throwing the thugs back. However, it doesn't take long for them to get back up and bring Terry down again. With no chance of winning the fight, Terry rockets himself into the air and he heads back to the Batcave. As Matt watches on the computer, he asks, how could Terry let them do that to him? Max tells him to give him a break, the odds were overwhelming, and Terry steps in saying no. What it came down to is the fact that I wasn't ready to become Batman again. I only recently came back from being dead. He got arrogant instead of recognizing the seriousness of it all and handling it like Bruce Taunham. Max asks him, who? And Terry says Wayne. Matt jumps in, stating that that was supposed to be a secret, but Terry hugs his brother Matt, telling him it's okay. They can trust Max, since he brought her here anyway. He goes on. This job might be a little bit too much for Batman. And Matt sulks at that response, telling him, don't be a quitter. A few moments later, Terry calls out that he just said that this is a fight that Batman couldn't do. And he steps out wearing clown makeup, telling Matt, I didn't say anything about not joining the Jokers. A little while later, the Batmobile flies through the Joker's town, firing down on some of the thugs from the Joker's club. As the thugs fire back, the Batmobile shoots off into the sky, and Matt shouts, Look out! Max tells him that she hasn't had much experience flying this thing, so give her a break. Plus, they have to make their plan look legit. Back on the rooftop, the large Joker thug from before grabs an air conditioning unit and throws it up into the air, hitting the Batmobile. As Max tries to stabilize the Batmobile, Terminal steps up onto the roof with a gun to Dana, shouting that unless he's gone in five seconds, the girl dies! A voice then tells Terminal, why let him go? There's no way that you could bring him down with those dinky pop guns. Terminal looks up and sees Terry. And Terry goes on stating, I'm a friend. A friend with a toy that rips. Terry lines up his shot and he fires a bazooka at the Batmobile. Terminal watches as the missile flies through the air, hitting the Batmobile, and he asks, You. And Terry stops him, telling him, I got you. You just needed the right tool for the right job. Over in the Batmobile, Matt says the fireworks look like a real explosion, and then Max flies down onto the ground. Terminal continues to watch, stating, That can't be that easy. And Terry asks, What? You think the bat bailed? Terminal tells him that he's not sure, and then the giant thug from before starts to crawl back up onto the roof. Terry helps him up, and the thug says that he's never seen him before. And Terry tells him, I'm just a friend, been in criminal modification therapy. Terminal steps up to him, telling him, no one just gets to drop in and claim he's in the club. Terry goes on to tell him, I figured my last name might help me open up the clubhouse doors. My father was Trey Malone, though you may have known him as Matches. Terminal tells him, I didn't know Matches had a kid. And as they go on, Dana listens, specifically listening to Terry, and realizing that is Terry and he's alive. Afterwards, Terminal takes Terry and the rest and they head over to the No Laughing Matter Club where he begins to get to know Terry. But while Dana tries to figure out why Terry would be back after so long, she finds herself not being watched and she slips down through the back. Everyone does start to take notice, so Terminal calls up for the large thug to go out and get her. Before he can go though, Terry steps in front of him, telling him to give him a chance to show off his talents. Terminal tells him, alone you don't. Everyone is getting on the streets. After a bit of running, Dana starts to navigate through the Joker's town back alleyway until she runs into someone. As she falls, the person asks if she's out of her mind. And when she looks back up, Dana says that she knows who he is. Please, just don't. Terry grabs her and tells her, Be quiet, I'm here to help you. Now just play along and we'll get you out of here alive. Some of the other thugs show up shouting that it's time to kill her, but Terry stops them, telling them, sure, but I'm pretty sure we have to ask the boss first. He was keeping her alive for something, right? Back at the club, Terry and the rest of the gang enter, and Terminal says how blessed they are to have someone so talented just fall into our laps. Go ahead and take her upstairs. Terry begins pulling Dana away, but once they get upstairs, Dana stops him, asking if it's really him. How is it even possible that Terry is back from the dead? Terry grabs her, telling her to relax, and he'll explain everything when the time is right. Right now, they just have to wait for his backup. As Danny gets close, she says that she still can't believe it's him. If only he knew what the Jokers were really up to. Terry asks her, what do you mean? And Dana goes on to explain that Terminal is actually their old friend Carter from back at high school. He always wanted to prove that he was the smartest, and now he's going to prove it by bringing the dead back to life. Dana unlocks the screen before them and Terry sees the Joker's body. She continues, yes, though cryogenically preserved, Terminal is on the verge of bringing him back. Terry stares, asking, why would he want to bring back the most heinous man ever? Terminal's voice then asks, why? Just to prove that I can. They both turn back and Terry and Dana see Terminal holding an old hollow photo of them in high school and Terminal stating, I knew you back in high school. I was happy when I heard that you died. Terminal then throws the photo into the wall, breaking it and he shouts, what's your story then? Are you a cop? More of a threat? Terry pulls back his arm and he grits his teeth, telling him, I'm the guy who's gonna stop you. But before he can punch, the large thug from before punches into Terry, telling him, Uh-uh. 
Terminal tells him you can't be a cop. You're working with Batman. That would be the only way to explain the stunt from before. While Terminal goes on, Terry fights back against the big thug, but before reaching Dana, Terminal punches him, and the large thug grabs and locks him into place. Terminal then says, It's a shame that you won't get to see what comes from my efforts. It's time for you both to go to the wall. A short while later, Matt sneaks closer to the club when he sees Terry and Dana hanging from the club building upside down. The large thug asks if the pebbles are ready, and another one says, Yep, builds with acid. He then tells everyone to fire, and soon all of the men release their slingshots, shooting acid-filled pebbles up at Terry and Dana. Meanwhile, back inside, Terminal stares at the Joker's room, and he tells the janitor to go on and leave. When the janitor leaves, Terminal heads into the cryo room, and he says, Can't let anyone see you and realize that you are in fact alive. He holds out the Joker's hand to scan over the belongings, and he says, I'm sure you would appreciate the greatest joke of them all. The device scans, and Terminal goes on. They all think that I'm bringing the Joker back to life, but the truth is, he's long dead. The scan completes, and it says, Transfer complete. You have received payment from Bruce Wayne. Back outside, all of the members of the Joker's gang begin to fire their slingshots, pelting Terry with acid-filled pellets. While everyone continues to bring more pellets over to shoot, Matt sneaks around the crowd and he makes his way into the club. Terry continues to try and struggle and he manages to pull out a knife and after cutting himself free, Terry starts to work on Dana's ropes and the large thug shouts, No one even frisked him?! Once free, Terry tells Dana to hold on to him while he pulls them back, and as they get closer, one of the thugs leans over the ledge with a gun. Terry quickly throws his knife into the gunman's shoulder, and Matt wrestles down the second individual. The other man starts to take Matt's bag, but before he can, Terry runs in, punching him to the ground. He shouts at Matt, asking what he's even doing here, and Matt hands over the bag, telling him, We found something. Terry pulls out another bat suit, and Dana stares, and then asks if he's... Terry tells her that he didn't want her to find out this way. He was going to find the right moment to tell her, but now is not the time to discuss it. Just then, the Jokers begin to fill the rooftop as Terry jumps in at the attackers. The Jokers turn their guns towards Dana and Matt, and without a second thought, Terry jumps in the way, shielding them. He wasn't 100% sure how the new suit would work, but it did seem to do the trick of blocking the shots. One of the Jokers shouts that they need to get the roasters, and Terry begins to think that he should probably end this. From his belt, he pulls out two small pills, and he asks if these could really be grenades. So he throws them, and after they explode, he says, I'm kind of glad I didn't swallow those. As more and more thugs fall, the large thug grabs Dana and shouts for Terry not to get any closer, and Terry asks, Closer? I don't need to be. From the back of Terry's hand, a flap opens, and small batterings fire out, and they land right into the thug's arm. He stumbles backwards, so then Terry runs in, punching him, telling him, We met the other day after you buried me, which clearly was not very neighborly of you. Terry finishes up, and then down below, the janitor runs in telling Terminal that Batman is here, and he just took out the whole crew. Terminal says, I can't be interfered with now. Go get the flyer. Back up top, after knocking everyone out, Dana asks, how long has he been... And Terry tells her, since high school. She realizes that he's been lying for years, and then she tells him that if he says he didn't tell her for her own good, she'll... But Matt stops them, saying that they can deal with this stuff later. Terminal's downstairs! The three of them run down the stairs into the cryo room where the Joker was being held. However, as Terry looks at the skaters, he sees that the person being held there was actually Bruce Wayne, which means Bruce is alive! Bruce was thought to be lost when Brother Eye first attacked. The bunker was attacked, and when Terry went to search, he couldn't find anyone alive. Not a single person. A short while later, Terry headed over to the Wayne Powers building, and Max asked what could Terminal want with Bruce. He says that his guess would be that he's looking for the Keystone, something that no one should even know about. The Keystone is the world's ultimate intel gathering device, and if Terminal can get his hands on that... Meanwhile, down on the building, Terminal says that he's on the cusp of having everything! The janitor asks what could be more important than bringing back the Joker, and Terminal walks off telling him, You're too much of a simpleton to realize where we are. We're here for one thing. He goes on. I told the Jokers that I was going to bring back the Joker so that he could amass an army of acolytes, all to keep Wayne alive. The janitor then asks, that means that this man isn't the Joker. And Terminal tells him, no, that's Bruce Wayne. Why would anyone want to bring that Joker back? The world is far better without him. As the two continue to walk, the janitor pulls Bruce and he asks, Why would you want to do this then? To take all of Wayne's fortunes? Terminal tells him, That's part of it, but the real goal is the keystone. The door that they are standing in front of then asks for an authentication scan, so Terminal props Bruce's body up for the retina scan. Once it's done, it says that the subject is fully authenticated. Welcome back, Bruce Wayne. It then opens, and Terminal sees Terry and shouts, Batman! Terry tells him, Yup. Once I realized that you had Wayne under your control, I figured that you would be smart enough to know about the keystone. Terry then runs into tackling and throwing terminals to the ground. He jumps up telling him that he thought that he was a man of limited resources, but you were wrong. 
Terminal pulls his belt off, wrapping it around Terry's neck, and Terry says that a belt won't, but then a current runs through the belt, shocking Terry. Terminal shouts that he won't be cheated when he's that close! However, as the two of them fight, the janitor takes out Bruce's tubes, telling him, It's time to wake up. I wouldn't want you to miss what's about to happen, old friend. The janitor then pushes Bruce's hover chair towards the open windows, and Bruce mumbles, that voice. He pushes the chair out the window and Terry charges in jumping after it. Once he's fully awake, Bruce tells Terry, forget me, we can't let those two escape. After grabbing the chair before it lands, Bruce shouts, I told you to leave me. And Terry tells him, it's nice to see you too, old buddy. While the janitor flies Terminal away, on another building, Max tells Matt that they're almost within range. He then locks on with his rocket launcher and tells her not to worry. They aren't getting anywhere. And he fires. The rocket flies, hitting the aircraft and Max says that they're still airborne, but they shouldn't get too far. Back in the Wayne's Powers building, Terry gets Bruce back up and without any talk, Bruce says that they need to get to the terminal. Terry takes off his mask telling him that he just needs to relax, be human for one second and embrace the fact that I don't know, you're alive? For once, the bad guys can wait. Bruce tries to stop him, but Terry goes on telling him, it's a great day, you're back and the Joker's still dead. But Bruce stares at Terry's eyes and he tells him about that. Meanwhile, on the outskirts of Gotham, Terminal begins to look over the aircraft, stating that him and the janitor need to hurry. They need to get this back into the air. The janitor tells him, No doubt. But really, you are a fool to think that you could beat Wayne. While still looking at the ship, Terminal tells him, Talk like that again and you're a dead man. Now get a crowbar so that we can take this thing apart. The janitor grabs a crowbar and he says, It was crazy to use the Joker's name like that. You should know. Besides, no one uses the Joker's name. The janitor then lifts the crowbar up, and he begins beating Terminal's head in until there's nothing but blood and brain tissue dropping from the end of it. He then begins to pull down his hood, and he says, No one uses my name! <laughs> With Bruce Wayne finally recovering and returning to the Batcave, he notices something different. Max, Terry's younger brother, tells him that Terry has kept everything the same as before. He didn't change a thing. And Bruce looks around and tells him, No, Terry didn't keep it the same. The Batcave was never a hangout for friends and family. Terry shouts from the upper levels, telling him that that's not fair. They just didn't know that he was alive. And Bruce scoffs, telling him, No insult intended, just making an observation. But as Terry goes on with Bruce telling him how good it is to see him again, Dana interrupts them and says that it's clear that they have a lot of catching up to do. Besides, Bruce isn't the only one here trying to adjust to the information that has currently been revealed. Terry hugs Bruce, telling him that it's good to have him back, but they can talk later. First, he has to go drop off Dana. Dana is his former girlfriend who didn't know that he was still alive, nor did she know that he is Batman Beyond. So basically, she got a lot of information in the last episode. Meanwhile, over at the GPD, Commissioner Barbara Gordon receives the identity reports of the person that they found. Carter Wilson, aka Terminal, was savagely beat to death with a crowbar. The officer says that they currently have no leads, but it may have been somebody who just happened to be around when his flyer went down. Barbara stares at the report stating that Terminal was too smart for that. It would have to have been somebody on the inside, someone that he trusted. But before Barbara can go any further, the door that she was reaching for is kicked in as she's knocked to the ground. She goes to grab her gun, telling the person that they've made a big mistake, but then she sees that it's the former League of Assassins member, Karari, standing in the doorway. Karari tells Barbara that her intentions are peaceful, but she requires immediate assistance. She must speak with Batman. Back in the Batcave, Bruce goes over the information on Terminal, and Terry's younger brother, Matt, asks Bruce if it's true. Is he really Batman? Bruce gives a low-sounding grunt, and Matt says that's awesome, it's good to have him back. Terry was having kind of a rough time without someone to guide him, like when his suit got shredded and they couldn't fix it. Luckily, they found an old experimental suit down here in the Batcave, and Bruce pauses. What suit? Describe it. Matt says that he can just pull up a file on it. All they know about it is that it worked great and helped Terry clear out the Jokers. The image appears on the screen and Bruce looks at it and he says that that is X7. And Matt says by the tone he's using, he sounded a bit worried. Bruce stares at the terminal and says, That suit was a prototype, one so dangerous to its wearer that it might get Terry killed. Over at the GPD rooftop, Barbara gets ready to turn on the bat signal, but before she can turn it on, she needs to know why. Why is Karari here? And she tells her that they have no time for an explanation, so Barbara says that she's gonna need a little more than that. 
That's when a voice tells the two women that it's too late for that and a group of assassins from the League of Assassins appear. Meanwhile, in another part of Gotham, Terry drops Dana off at her apartment and he says that he's sorry for not telling her earlier that he's Batman. The lying to everyone was really getting to him. Dana tells him no. She saw the look in his face when he was rescuing her. He loved every second of being Batman. Terry sighs, telling her, maybe, but he can't do it Bruce's way. Right now, all he wants to do is be human again. Dana leans in and tells Terry that he's a nice guy, maybe too nice to be Batman. And he leans in, telling her, from now on, I'm gonna put myself first, Batman second. Just before the two of them can kiss, the bat signal lights up in the sky. Dana says that it looks like he has to go, but Terry tells her, no, not this time. I can't lose myself in Batman. Besides, how bad could it really be? Back on the GPD rooftop, Barbara and Karori are backed into the corner of the rooftop. However, over at the Wayne Mansion, Bruce and Max discuss Terry's rise as Batman when Matt runs in shouting that they have a big problem. Everyone heads back to the Batcave and Matt yells that the bat signal is going off, but Terry isn't picking up his phone. Bruce connects to one of the satellites and then he zooms in on the GPD rooftop to see Barbara and Karari are at the losing end of their battle. He says, this is really bad. If the League is out in force, the only thing that can stop them is Batman. While Karari tries to fight back, one of the assassins targets Barbara. She quickly jumps back in to help, but the moment that her back is turned, shurikens are thrown into it. Back with Terry, Dana says that it might be important, he might need to go, and Terry tells her, All I want right now is, but before he can finish, his phone goes off, and that's when he sees that it's Bruce, so he ignores it and turns the phone off. Bruce says that he shut his phone off like a five-year-old. What he needs to understand is that people are dying right now. Up on the rooftop, Barbara is struck with an arrow, and one of the assassins calls out to cut the power to the bat signal. Just then, a sword is swung, cutting the cable. Terry looks up at the sky, and he says, Look, it couldn't have been that important, it went out. However, Dana feels her phone go off, and when she looks at it, she tells Terry that it's for him. Terry tells Bruce that he really needs to back off, and then he sees images of Barbara and Karari making their stand. Up on the rooftop, Barbara reaches for the arrow in her back, and Karari rips it out, using it to stab another assassin. Karari then looks at the never-ending group of assassins and says the League is here because of her, and for that she is sorry. Then another voice says, that makes two of us. And a second later, Terry flies in, clearing the path. While Terry begins taking out the assassins, Bruce and Matt watch at the Batcave, and Bruce says that that suit that Terry is wearing is a prototype, never to be worn by anyone ever again. More assassins come out of the shadows, so Terry pulls out his claws, telling them, looks like I'm gonna need a more hands-on approach. He starts to cut away into the assassins, and Bruce radios back that he needs to stop. He needs to get back now. After taking out the last two assassins, Terry looks at all of the dead ones, and he says, I'll be back in a bit. First, I need to find out why Karari is even here. Karari hands over a vid, telling Terry that he needs to see this. She's here to make sure that he watches it. The video begins to play and an image of a Himalayan temple appears and a voice can be heard rallying their men. The voice tells the League of Assassins that now it is time for them to rise. It is time for one of them to take the magnificent opportunity and exploit it. The more Terry listens, the more he realizes who that voice is. It's Ra's al Ghul and he's alive. Bruce shouts over the radio that Terry needs to come back with that suit. They can deal with Roz later. Karari calls her flyer over and says that they must leave now. So Terry radios back that if it's true that Roz is back, there is no time for him to return. He has to leave. As the flyer approaches, a man calls out to Karari, telling her that she shouldn't have left her craft unguarded. Terry looks up to see a man wielding two swords on her ship, and he says, I'm going to assume that that guy's not a friend. Karari tells him, no, that's Koro, the demon's right hand. Just then, Koro leaps from the flyer at Karari, asking if she really thought that she could betray the League and succeed. The two swords slam into the ground, forcing everyone to jump back, and Koro looks at Terry, telling him, it's Batman, or so what he calls himself. Karari lands on her flyer and shouts to Terry to just leave him, but Koro knocks Terry with the butt of his sword. He swings down on Terry, telling him, I cannot believe that you were allowed to defile his image. Terry jumps up, kicking back Koro, and then he starts to make his way towards the flyer. Koro looks up, stating, I will not let you go, and Karari jumps back, stating that the ship is set to autopilot. She'll deal with Koro. The ship's hatch closes on Terry as he shouts, Wait! Hang on! I'm not ready! Koro then punches through Karari's guard and stabs through her chest. As the sword is pulled out, Barbara shouts that she's gonna get help, and Koro says that it's a shame that my master has an urgent need for me, or else I would deal with you as well. Up in the ship, Terry tries breaking the hatch, yelling that he will blast his way out if he has to, and a voice in his head tells him no. We were programmed by Wayne to act as he would. Communication with the wearer can facilitate maximum effectiveness to ensure that Batman succeeds, even if the man inside cannot. Back at the Batcave, Bruce says that he fears that the suit's AI will overwhelm Terry. It is programmed for one thing, that Batman will never fail. 
Matt asks how bad could it really be, and Bruce explains that during his final days as Batman, he wore that suit. People were dying, the police were beaten, and so was he. The Banes were out of control, and he needed more strength, more speed, so the suit was developed. It was designed to block pain, override cautionary judgment, and make sure that whatever the job was, it got done. Wearing the suit, I was unstoppable. Broken ribs? No problem when you don't feel pain. But then the AI started to take over, and after having two cracked vertebrae, you shouldn't even be able to stand. However, the suit put me right back up, and I kept fighting. Until it was over. Max says that no one should ever use that thing, and Bruce says, One other did. Once. But that's in the past. Bruce tells everyone that he'll stay here and get in contact with Terry. They need to take it easy for now, it's going to be a long night. Meanwhile, over in the Himalayas, Terry flies closer to Roz's temple when the suit's AI indicates that they are getting closer. However, there is ground activity detected. Terry asks what kind, and the suit responds, telling him surface-to-air missile. And a second later, the aircraft is hit with a missile. It explodes, and Terry jumps to the temple's entrance, stating, Well, it looks like Roz is home. The assassins begin running out, and Terry smiles, stating, I'm hoping that you have help nearby, because you're going to need it. Back in the mansion, Max and Matt both wait to eat, but that's when Matt notices the Batmobile take off. Inside, Bruce says, I couldn't let anyone else take this one. The demon is my problem, no one else's. Over at the temple, Terry continues ripping through the crowds until the last one falls and then a voice calls out, Welcome, Pretender. Terry turns back to see Roz and then he jumps right away to beat him down. Roz deflects the attack, asking, Since when did Batman kill his foes? Is that another indicator that you truly aren't Batman? The two continue to fight, and then Terry manages to punch away Roz's helmet, and that's when he stops, because the one under that helmet is not Roz at all. It is Damian Wayne. Terry stares for a moment, and the AI says, with the retina scan of voice analysis confirming it, it is Damian Wayne. Terry says, I've always wondered about you, like how I got the suit and Bruce's own son. One of his Robins didn't. Damian tells him, the answer is simple, pretender. I did. The two go back and forth exchanging blows, and Terry asks, If that's the case, what happened? Couldn't live up to the brand? Damien throws one of his swords, telling him, One of the answers should be clear. People need the suit to be effective, however, I do not. Terry lunges to tackle, but Damien catches him and throws him through a window down into the lower levels of the temple. The suit announces that the opponent is fully skilled in all forms of personal combat. He is likely the single most accomplished opponent that you will ever- Terry shouts back at the suit, SHUT UP! I'm feeling good about this! Damien makes his way down to continue the assault, and the suit says, For you to prevail, lethal means are required. Meanwhile, just outside, Bruce lands the Batmobile and starts his hike up the mountain, thinking back to the last time that he even saw Damien. It was when Roz was upgrading his technology to stay current with the times. And to stop it, Damien wore the X7 suit. As he watched him leave, Bruce could feel the ferocity in Damien, and it sent chills down his spine. Damien fought for four straight hours until almost all of Roz's army was wiped out, and that's when his own son became someone that he didn't recognize. As he came to the scene, he found the tattered remains of the suit, but no Damien. The suit had changed Damien. He had taken up his grandfather's mantle. But before Bruce could dwell any further on what had happened in the past, a voice calls out to him, and Koro tells him, that's far enough. I'm thankful for this chance to meet you because now I will do what my father could not. Bruce says, I'm going to take a wild guess that your father is. But before Bruce could finish, Kor punches him, telling him, my father was Ubu. Back inside, Terry charges back at Damien and Damien tells him, there's one more thing that I don't need and that's weapons. Not when I can use my opponents against him. Damien reaches into the suit's compartments and takes out two small explosives, throwing them back at Terry, throwing him outside into the snow. He then jumps down telling him, there's one thing that I know about the suit and that's his vulnerabilities, such as the exact frequency needed to jam the cyberlink. Terry gets up looking around noticing several speakers pointed at him and then a screeching sound blasts into the field. The sound stuns Terry and Damien moves in knocking him to the ground telling him, I knew Karari would seek you out. I knew how this would play out and all I wanted most of all was you. Over with Bruce, Koro beats down on him, telling him, My master said that this was supposed to be a challenge, but there is no concern for that. After picking up and throwing Bruce to the ground, Bruce quickly spins over his back and takes out his grappling gun and fires. The anchor hits Koro in the stomach, knocking the wind out of him, and Bruce then struggles, getting up, telling him, That's one down. As he gets closer to the temple, he sees a pit, and then his eyes widen. He shouts, No! And Damien holds a sword over Terry's body, and he tells him, Welcome! You're just in time to see the pretender die, father. Bruce yells for him to stop, so Damien takes a sword and slams it into the ground next to Terry's head. Damien tells Bruce, You should know that I wouldn't kill a compromised weak opponent, especially one so inferior to me. Bruce asks, how should I know? The fact that you're here makes me realize that I barely know who you are anymore. Damien looks back telling him, even still, 
You know a great deal about me. Like the fact that even though I never came for you, I would come for the Pretender. While Bruce and Damien argue, the suit's AI begins to reboot and it tells Terry, the efficiency levels are at 72%. You are clear to engage the enemy. Terry jumps to his feet and he runs tackling Damien, telling him, you must feel good winning round one. Terry reaches back and throws a handful of batarangs and with each swing, Damien cuts through them all. As the two clash, Damien tells him, you had the element of surprise. You should have put it to better use, Pretender. Bruce yells, this doesn't need to happen. And Damien tells him, of course it does. In fact, it's long overdue, father. Terry tries to keep up with Damien's pace, but as they fight, Damien seems to be one step ahead. And after being knocked back down, Terry lays in the snow and Damien tells him, get up. As Terry struggles, the suit pushes him and the AI says, deadly force restrictions are waived. The two spinning blades swing out of Terry's wrist and he screams running back into the fight. He recklessly swings at Damien with Damien blocking each hit and he says, good, the suit is taking over. That means that I could stop holding back, including utilizing all of my weapons. He calls out, come at me, my old friend. And then there's a rumble and from the cave, we see the giant red beast Goliath charging out. Punching into Terry from behind, he knocks him to the ground. Terry tries to fight back the giant bat beast and Damien laughs, telling him, the pretender left himself open to attack from behind, truly an inadequate replacement for me. Damien turns back to Bruce and he tells him, the reason I left is because I wanted to. As for returning, I did once, but it was clear that I shouldn't have even bothered. Bruce asks him, because of Terry, I searched for you, but I couldn't. And Damien stops him telling him, don't lie. The great Batman could find anyone that he wants. You gave up on me. However, I hold no malice. It was just that I had realized that Batman's focus was limited to Gotham. Roz's worldview was more expansive. When Batman worried about the night, Roz focused on the future. Roz had regenerated himself in the Lazarus Pit so often that it could not be done again. His time as an immortal would soon end. I knew that Brother I would eventually recognize the humans as imperfections and eradicate them. I knew that we had to prepare. Damien then says, just think of the irony. Earth's greatest peril was not the work of Ra's al Ghul, but Batman himself. With Raz's passing, I knew that his view of the world was actually right. Earth was dying, its population dragged into a cesspool of filth. Reconfiguration was the only answer. The ground slowly begins to shake as a silo opens up revealing five missiles and Bruce shouts, there's no way that I will allow you to fire those. Bruce then grabs Damien's jacket as Damien tells him, if I thought you were capable of stopping me, I would not allow you to come here. Goliath grabs Bruce and throws him and Damien continues telling him, you are here to witness the next step of Earth's evolution. Bruce gets up telling him, this isn't you. The suit did this. It alters your mind. And Damien shouts, wrong. I'm exactly what I was raised to be. Terry calls out, if it was the suit, I should be thanking it. And as everyone turns back, he can see Terry on top of Goliath using his collar to choke him. He pulls the chains tighter, struggling, telling him, I admire your ruthlessness, seeing a job that needs to be done and just doing it no matter the cost. After a few moments, Goliath falls to the ground, lifeless, and Terry hops off, stating, so much for your pet. Terry's face then breaks out in a smile, still holding the chain, telling Damien, now it's your turn. Damien pops out two blades from his gauntlets and shouts, for killing Goliath, you will die. He rushes pinning Terry to the ground and Bruce takes that chance to run over to the silo's terminal. He hits away at the keys, trying to override it with all of Damien's old passwords, but nothing is working. Meanwhile, while Damien gets back off of Terry, he says, it's just as I thought. You're nothing but a pretender. And even with Terry's body badly injured, he jumps to his feet, picking Damien up by the throat, shouting, Stop calling me that! While Damien goes back to attacking the suit directly, he hears Koro's voice telling Bruce, You left me for dead. He grabs Bruce by the back of the head and he slams him into the council, shouting, My father died a defeated man because of you. Other assassins shunned him, and in his despair, he sought to regain some shred of honor by taking his own life. Koro cracks Bruce across the face and he begins to choke him, telling him, You will never do that to anyone again. While Damien gasps for air, he muffles out to Karo, don't do it, that is my father. The suit AI tells Terry not to break, eliminate the enemy, and Terry struggles to control the suit. With all of his might, he loses his grip on Damien, telling him to go. Koro says, I care not if this man is your father, he dies. Damien runs in, tackling Koro, telling him, I gave you an order to stand down and you will do so. He gets back up, telling him, when the head of the demon gives an order, you follow. But before Damien can react, the suit's AI takes back over and attacks while Terry is shouting, I don't want to. Terry knocks Damien to the ground and the suit says to strike, taking out the arm blade and Terry says, I, I can't, I, I'm not doing this. Bruce hurries over telling Terry, you have to stop. I can't let you kill my son. If you do, you're going to have to go through me first. Terry struggles and he thrusts his arm down, barely missing Bruce. And Bruce says, that's it. He's fighting back. Terry crawls away as he claws in the mask until finally he rips it off. Bruce reaches down to Terry telling him, you did it. You beat the suit. He then looks at Damien 
If this is your way to draw me out after all of these years, you've made your point. Deep down, I know this isn't what you want. This isn't the way. Please, abandon this course. Let us work together to get a real solution. Damien's hand hovers over the launch button, and then there's a low grumbling coming from behind them. Goliath weakly howls, Ow! And Damien runs over, shouting, He's alive! Then Koro says, you are nothing more than infidels. You may have betrayed the one true head of the demon, but I will not. Korra then slams his fist down on the launch button and the rockets begin to fire. As they take off, Korra says, those are DNA toxins designed to eradicate all but the strongest. Damien spins back, punching him, telling him, that was not your call to make. Bruce says, we have to redirect them. And Damien tells him it's impossible. Once they're launched, the targets are locked in. Terry pulls the mask back down, telling them both, don't worry, I got this. Damien shouts for him to wait, but Terry's already in the air before he can finish the sentence. Bruce tells him that hopefully the suit in its weakened state will be enough, but it's the weakness that is in it now that may doom Terry. He shoots up grabbing the rockets and using the pulse blasters, he pushes two of the rockets, colliding with two other rockets, bringing the number down from five to one. But with more energy spent, the suit indicates that its power is rapidly dropping. Terry asks, what still even works if that's the case? And the suit tells him nothing. Just then, the power shorts out and Terry begins to plummet back to the Earth. Back at the Batcave, Matt shouts to Max that they have to do something. And she says that she's working on it. Let's see if... And then up in space, the missile continues on its path. And then a satellite steers into that path, causing it to explode. Matt says that it worked, and then he radios over to Terry that they did it, but Terry doesn't respond. Not far away, Bruce and Damien ride up in the Batmobile, and Bruce says that they have one shot. They gotta make sure it's perfect. Damien jumps out with a rocket pack, stating that he's incapable of any other way. He reaches out, grabbing onto Terry, and deploys the parachute, allowing them both to safely land. A short while later, once everyone's back in the ground, Bruce tells Damien that he would still like him to come back to Gotham. And Damien tells him, not now. The day will come when I return, though. Terry says that they can have balloons and cake and confetti in the Batcave. We can have confetti in the Batcave, right, Bruce? Bruce and Damien shake their heads. And Damien says, I will eventually come back, but there are some positives I can accomplish leading the league. The two hug, and Damien and Goliath return to the temple as Bruce and Terry get back into the Batmobile, and they take off. Terry says, you know, for being old, you're starting to soften up. It's okay to be a dad. And Bruce tells him, it's even better to feel like I have two sons. The Bowery had always been one of Neo Gotham's worst neighborhoods, and for the inner district of Crown Point, it was exceptionally true. The point leads the city in homelessness, arson, prostitution, and violent crimes. There was a place where no one would come looking for them, not the mayor, not the cops, not even Batman. With Terry and Bruce still over in Tibet, Terry's brother Matt and friend Max keep watch over the city from the Bat Cave, monitoring police activity. But their quiet night is short-lived when they receive a distress call on GCPD Commissioner Barbara Gordon, who was the former Bat Girl. Also at this time, over in Leslie Tompkins High School, some of the students head home for the day when one suggests that they should all head over to the local arcade. One girl, Nisa, tells them that she can't. She has to head straight home for uh, getting in a fight with a teacher who may or may not have been selling drag to the middle schoolers. Another girl asks, did Batman ever capture the guy? And Nisa tells him, nah. Batman would never show up in their part of town. He might get his fancy suit all dirty. But what people don't know is that the one keeping watch over Crown Point is Nisa herself. Because she is the new Batgirl. Over in the Batcave, Max scans through Barbara's last known whereabouts and decides without Terry or Bruce there, she's going to be the one to come to the rescue. A short while later, back at Crown Point, Nisa learns from the local gang that the drugs one of the teachers was selling was coming from someone that was meeting at the old bus depot at 10 p.m. As the time comes, she has eyes on the place, and Nisa calls back that it's cute that they think that they could sneak up on her. Max is the one sneaking up on her, and calls out telling her that she was just trying her shoes. Who said she's hiding? They're on the same side. Nisa tells her that maybe she is, maybe she isn't. She doesn't know her. And since when did good Samaritans care about cops moving drugs into the point? Max says that something is going on here, drugs or not. She's got a friend who's caught up in it, Commissioner Gordon to be exact. She goes on explaining that Barbara was investigating something shady and her signal went dark. She did manage to get out of a distress call before she went missing though. At first, Nisa tells Max that it's nice that she's come here to try and help, but she's fine on her own. They can take care of their own in this place. But before the two can argue as to whether or not Max should help the new Batgirl or not, they spot the deal going down and Nisa jumps down telling Max, welcome to their side of the town. Try not to fall behind. Inside of the building, Barbara sits tied to the chair, and as the officers surrounding her discuss what they plan to do with her, Officer Arnold Flass steps out. Flass leans down to Barbara, telling her that she knows a lot about what they're doing here, doesn't she? And Barbara says that she's actually not surprised. Dirty cops run in his family. Up from the shadows, both Max and Nisa jump down around the surrounding men, and they prepare to fight. 
Flash takes out his gun, and Barbara kicks back in her chair, knocking off his aim. Nisa runs in to disarm him, stating that he must be the one who arrested that teacher who was selling drugs. Max makes it over to Barbara to help uncover, but as one of the officers takes a swing at her, he falls through seeing that she was only a hologram. Though she isn't physically there, Max did turn off the electronic cuffs, allowing Barbara to get up and join the fight. Max continues to provide support while Nisa and Barbara go fight their way out of there, and just as the crooked cops are taken care of, Flash makes a break for it. He laughs, telling Nisa that she must be from around here. No wonder it was so easy for them to take this hole over. It's like the people were asking for it. You're all so weak. Nisa jumps on Flash, knacking him to the ground. And Flash yells, Come on, kid. You know the law of the point. Do it. Take me out. Or do you not have the guts to do it? You're all just weak and pathetic, practically begging to be taken advantage of. She starts punching into him, shouting for him to just shut up, shut up, shut up. But before she can go on, Barbara stops her, stating that she could go on, but she'd be just like them. The bat symbol on her chest means that she doesn't have to do what's expected. She's got nothing to prove. Not to him, not to her, only herself. Who is she? Who are the people of Crown Point? Nisa gets off last stating that he's not worth it. In Crown Point, they're worth more. Barbara goes on telling Nisa that she can see how hard she fights, and right now Crown Point needs hope. She can be that hope. Nisa takes her grappling gun and fires it, pausing for a moment, and then telling Barbara thank you. And Barbara tells her that she just wants her to know. She's doing right by that symbol. A few days later, while Nisa goes back out on patrol, she tells Max that she can hear her. And Max says that she really needs to get quieter shoes. But then something is thrown, and as Nisa catches it, Max explains that it's a biometric communicator. But really, she wanted to know what she thought about Gordon's offer. They could do a lot of good working together without Batman riding shotgun. Nisa looks at the communicator, stating maybe. But if she asks her, maybe them bat women could be just fine. But before Max could ask any further, Nisa tugs on her rope and jumps off the ledge. Barbara walks out stating that she never got to see if she was doing okay. And Max asks if they're really doing enough. Barbara puts her hand on Max's shoulder, telling her that it's never ever really enough, but they can do everything that they can. If Batgirl needs backup, they need to be there and keep an eye on her. Let her know that she's one of them and not alone. As Sheriff McGinnis' body is thrown down the walls of the Gotham City Transit Authority, Shriek yells, You are not welcome here, so don't come back! Once Terry stops, he gets up stating that he always wondered what happened to him after he was thrown into Blackgate. Shriek yells at him again, Time to leave! And Terry tells him, Don't worry, I'm not here for you, unless you're the one behind this mess. As Shriek charges another blast, Terry yells, Fine! Fine! I'm leaving! And after passing around a corner, Terry releases some smoke pellets to try and give himself some time until he can find the terminal that he's looking for. Meanwhile, over in Gotham Heights Arena, Barbara tells Mayor Fox that Batman is on his way to the shutoff. Fox says good, they need this matter resolved quickly, Commissioner. If they can't shut down the city's anti-air defenses, then they're gonna have a little bit more than just a minor inconvenience on their hands. Down at the subway, Terry finds the first shutoff terminal, and he asks why do they have to spread the manual shutoffs for the aerial defense system across three remote locations? Couldn't Bruce have put it in something like Gotham Heights? The terminal beeps as Terry finishes the first shutdown, and then a voice asks if that's really Batman. Terry turns to see several people, and the voice asking if it's him is coming from a little girl. He kneels down asking what she's doing here, and the girl happily tells him that they've arrived after the invasion. It was the only way into Gotham from the outer boroughs. Terry says that they shouldn't have to live like this. Follow him, and he'll lead them to the surface. The little girl tells him that they don't want to leave. This is their home. And just then a low rumbling from Shriek can be heard. Terry jumps up onto the ladder to the surface, yelling, I'm going to come back for you. And the girl tells him, it's okay, Walter keeps us safe down here. However, just as Terry pulls himself out of the sewer, he's struck by a metal staff and sparks fly. The suit's AI tells him, warning, system compromised. The man holding the staff tells Terry, welcome to Chinatown. Consider this your official eviction notice. Terry then takes off into the air to escape and he remembers why he's turning off the city's aerial defenses. A turret shoots down at Terry, knocking him back to the ground and the man from before asks, you must be stubborn, huh? Terry looks at him, telling him, Look, whatever your name is, I don't have any beef with you. The man says, Around here, people call me the hacker. Terry gets back up, telling him, Come on, I just need to get to the Bowery District so that I can shut off the defense system. But rather than listen, Hacker taps one of the nearby cars with his staff, telling him that the suit's coding is quite remarkable. Unlike these cars, which are easily reprogrammable. Suddenly, the car Hacker touched revs up and takes off trying to hit Terry. As more cars go after him, Terry begins to hop away in the roofs of the cars, telling him, Okay, this guy is totally one note. 
He then yells, I'm gonna take it that you're not the one behind the defense system's malfunction. Hacker reaches up touching a vending machine, telling him, we're on the base level of Gotham. Whatever happens above never benefits us down here. Here, take a party gift. Suddenly the vending machine begins to shoot out cans of soda as if they were weapons. And Terry shoots them down, telling him, ah, oh, you really shouldn't have. As he begins to get away, he makes his way to the next shutoff terminal, and he sighs, stating that he really hopes he has enough time to make it to Matt's game. But just then, Terry begins to remove the cover, and green shards shoot by, knocking him down, and a woman says, how fortuitous, that we should meet again, Batman, after you murdered Michael. Terry begins to shout, asking, Freon! And the suit's AI yells, danger. Radiation levels exceed suit's tolerance. Freon floats down, telling Terry, it was Batman who took away my love, and now I will repay you and Gotham for turning me into a monster. I overrid the city's own defense system to turn it against itself as you did with us. There is no escape now. Death follows in my wake. Terry scrambles to get back up into the terminal, telling her, Look, I'm sympathetic, but all I wanted to do today was just watch people that I care about compete in the Gotham games. Freon hits Terry with another irradiated blast, encasing him in green crystal, shouting, You're not going anywhere! But just as she does, she stops, looking into Terry's eyes, asking, Michael? Michael, is that you, my love? However, the crystal prison shatters, freeing Terry, and from behind, Shriek tells Hacker, Thanks for the enhancement. Terry then falls to the ground, telling them, Yeah, thanks for coming. And Shriek tells him the girl Aya told him what he was trying to do. Living down there gave him a purpose. Perhaps it's time that we reassessed old perspectives. And Terry says, well, right now we need to stop Freon from killing all of Gotham. Terry then calls out to Hacker to shut down the entire defense system while Shriek breaks up the asphalt underneath Freon. The metal coils within the ground begin to shoot up, and Terry throws a battering, hitting one and tangling it around Freon to keep her in place. She shouts, and they cannot contain her! Nothing can! You will all die! And Terry then tells Hacker to hit the coils with the staff to hit Freon's suit. As the shockwave goes through the metal and into Freon's suit, she falls to the ground, and Hacker says that he just recalibrated her suit. Not sure how long, though. Terry looks up the screen, seeing Matt playing in the Gotham games, and tells him, Awesome! I still got time to catch the game. As the sounds of sirens can be heard, Hacker tells Terry to hurry and get out of there. And as the cops arrive, Terry flies off and Shriek tells him, Yeah, it's time that we split up. After the events of running into Bruce's son Damien, Bruce finally found time to perform surgery on his back, and he is not happy about it. As Terry and Matt bring Bruce into Wayne Manor, the first thing he asks is for his cane. Terry tells him that he really should be taking it easy so that he can heal up. That and the doctor said to stay in the wheelchair. But as Terry begins to move the cane away, Bruce snatches it from his hands, telling him that he's going to be fine. He just needs to. However, after taking a few short steps, Bruce stumbles back into his wheelchair, telling Terry that if he thinks he's going to let a horde of nurses and caretakers in, Terry tells him, yeah, about that. Matt and him knew that that wouldn't be an option, which is why both of them are moving in. Bruce stares at him for a moment, and Terry goes on stating that it wasn't long ago that he told Damien that he felt that he had two sons. The fact is, he needs help around here. Bruce tries to think of something to say to argue against it, but he ends up telling him that he's right. His home is now their home. Bruce then tells Terry to come with him to the Batcave. There's something he'd like to show him. As Bruce types away at the computer, the Batman suit lights up, and Bruce says that the suit's AI almost killed him. So they're going back to the original. Though the AI has been removed, there have been a few improvements that they've added. So from now on, he's going to get by on his wits and guile to make it work. Terry tells Bruce that he appreciates the offer, but before Batman can make a public appearance, there's someone he has to talk to. A short while later, at Terry's girlfriend Dana's apartment, she continues her workout when she hears the buzzer at the door go off. As Dana opens it up, she looks at Terry and says that she's been wondering where he's been for the past few days. She didn't know if he was... Terry stops her and says that he's fine. He understands that his absences are tough to handle, which is why he's here, so they can talk about it. Dana lets Terry in and asks, does it mean that he's done being Batman? And Terry tells her, no, in fact, he's going to embrace it. Just like he's embraced the idea of them being together. He hoped that she would accept who he is and all of the chaos that that comes with. Dana tells him that after losing him for so long and thinking that he was dead, yes, she's willing to try if he is. Back over at the Batcave, Commissioner Barbara Gordon calls Bruce to go over what's been happening since he's been gone. As the two talk, Matt starts to wander around the Batcave looking at all of the old Robin gear. As Matt looks at the computer, he finds old videos of Bruce teaching Damien some basics of combat. Once the conversation between Bruce and Barbara is over, Bruce goes back to looking over the bat suit when Matt comes running back shouting that he just saw the bat signal go up. Bruce looks at the suit and says, good, this will be a perfect night for a test. A short while back at Dana's apartment, Terry takes a shower when he suddenly hears Dana scream for him in the other room. Terry runs out in just a towel asking what's wrong as she points to the window stating that. And as Terry looks, he says, damn it, Bruce. 
could have called first. In front are two floating small bat drones with a video feed of Bruce, and he says, Sorry, but time is of the essence. The drone releases a small package, and the bat suit unfolds, and Dana says that this must be the chaos that he was talking about. Later, over at the Gotham Museum of Fine Arts, King Jack and Ace of the Royal Flush Gang destroy some priceless artwork, asking if they think that this will get Batman to show. A few seconds later, Terry flies in, knocking everyone away, asking, was this what they wanted? And as Terry focuses on taking down Ace, Jack hits Terry from behind with a heat blast, allowing King to make his move. King swings down with one of his swords, but Terry brings his arm up to deflect the hit, punching it back, telling him, you know, I wasn't impressed with you before and I'm still not. Jack attacks again by throwing a supercharged card, telling him that that will be his last mistake. But while Terry dodges those, Ace grabs him from behind, similar to how Bane grabbed Bruce. And then as Bruce and Matt are watching the video feed, Ace brings Terry down, snapping his back, just as Bane did to Bruce. Flashbacks begin to start playing in Bruce's mind, and Bruce says that if he was a praying man, he'd pray that history doesn't repeat itself, but he's not a praying man. As Ace lets go, Terry springs back up, throwing an explosive battering through Ace's stomach, and then he tells him, come on! Did you really think to break the back over the knee routine would work against a suit that could withstand sunfire? King shouts that he just killed Ace, and Terry tells him, oh, relax, Ace was a machine. King yells as he lunges at Terry, and Terry catches him, and he throws him, telling him, maybe you could fix Ace back up, make him as good as new. As King's body is thrown through Ace, Terry tells him, oops, maybe not. Bruce then radios in telling Terry that he needs to be careful. Jack is still with them, and as Jack fires another heat blast, Terry blocks it, telling him, right, with my patented butt burner vision. Jack then flies down towards Terry, and Terry jumps up, telling him that he really needs to pay attention to these things, like making sure not to break his neck. As Terry comes back down, he lands on the back of Jack's flying card, flinging him upwards and into the air, and Jack yells that they still have him outnumbered, but as the two of them get back up, Terry throws two pairs of bolas, tying the two of them up. Terry then picks King back up, asking who's funding them. They couldn't be doing all of this on their own, not without some kind of backup. And King says, alas, even if I knew, I wouldn't tell you. Bruce then radios in that these guys are clueless, like Gordon or people take it from here. And as Terry leaves, a man watches and says that he's rather insulted that they didn't come to him first. A hologram appears behind the man in the shadows, telling him that he knew that they wouldn't succeed, though he expected better, and the shadowy man asks, what exactly is it that you want? The hologram then says to engage Batman so that he can be analyzed to make his job a little easier. The shadowy man says that he needs no help. He'll carry out his wishes as long as he provides what he offered in the hologram fades. The figure tells him two months worth of food shall be delivered to his village as soon as he delivers Batman. Stalker. Meanwhile, over at the Batcave, Matt continues to watch over videos of Bruce and Damien, acting out Damien's moves the same way that Damien did. As he does, a woman sneaks into Matt's room looking for something. The alarm goes off and Matt runs in stating that he's on it and he runs upstairs and as he gets to the room, he sees the masked woman holding something and he asks what she's doing in his room. The masked woman says that she was just leaving and runs past Matt and back out the window. Matt heads into his room to look at what she took and sees the only thing that is missing is a picture of Terry. A short while later, back at Dana's apartment, Dana gets ready for another workout when Terry climbs into the window. She shouts that she doesn't live on the 137th floor to have men climbing through her window, you know. And he tells her, fair point. How about I take you out for dinner then? But before she can give him a real answer, the walls explode, and a blue cord reaches out, grabbing Dana. As she's pulled outside, Terry chases after her, and Stalker says that it's been a while, McGinnis. Give yourself up and the girl lives. As Terry gets ready to fight, Matt watches the feed, yelling out that it's Stalker. Bruce tells him that he remembers, and Matt asks how couldn't he? Stalker found out Terry was Batman and kidnapped him. Bruce says that it doesn't make any sense. Terry and Stalker have come to an understanding. Why attack now? His village was hit hard by the invasion, leaving his village with toxic chemicals making the water supply undrinkable. Does this have something to do with why he's doing this? Back out with Terry, Terry flies close, throwing a battering to cut the cord at three Dana, with Stalker asking if he's trying to save her or kill her. Terry then asks if there's any doubt, and he swoops down to catch her. As he starts to fly away, Stalker aims his spear at Terry and fires a small arrowhead projectile. The projectile shoots through Terry's wings, causing him to fall, and Stalker tells him, I expected more from Batman. As Terry and Dana begin to descend, Stalker takes aim with his spear again, firing an electrical blast, forcing Terry to let go of Dana. Dana begins to scream as she starts to fall faster, but Terry's wings regenerate fast enough for him to slow down, grabbing Dana by the hand, setting her on a nearby building. She asks, what is he doing, leaving her here? And Terry flies back up, telling her that it's the safest option. Now run! 
He flies back up, throwing a handful of explosives at Stalker, and Stalker tells him that he's become more aggressive. Good. And then he hits Terry with a blast at the chest. Terry stumbles back, and as he does, Stalker fires another cord from the end of his spear to grab Terry by the legs, and he jumps down onto a fuel truck. Stalker kicks in the windshield, reaching down, telling him that he's doing this for his village. If he can bring Batman in, his village can eat. As Stalker grabs the lever, he pulls back on the thrusters to try and start burning Terry. The fuel truck then begins to pick up speed, where Terry asks himself, what is he going to do in this kind of situation? He leans down, grabbing the cord, pulling himself up closer towards the thrusters. Once in place, he throws an explosive batarang inside, causing the the thrusters to explode. The fuel truck starts to fly out of control and it crash lands on the top of a nearby building. A few seconds later, the fuel ignites, causing the building to be covered in flames, and Stalker calls out, calling to Terry that he's coming for him. Soon, Terry turns off his cloaking device, and as Stalker turns back, he said that he was supposed to deliver him alive, but his corpse will have to do. Terry claws at his back, and as he punches him down, he tells him it's over. Admit it! And Stalker thrusts the bottom of his spear up, knocking Terry away, and as Terry gets back up, he throws three batarangs. Stalker waves his spear to deflect all three, and he tells him, you know, a smart hunter wouldn't always focus on what's in front of him. He would also watch his back. But before Terry has a chance to react, the cord from Stalker's spear creeps up from behind, grabbing Terry, flinging him into the air. Stalker then pushes a button on the spear, electrifying it, slamming Terry back onto the ground. Stalker then takes the cable, wrapping it around Terry's neck, telling him, for my village to live, you gotta die. As Terry tries to break free, Stalker then pulls at his mask, almost exposing his face to all of the news bots that are flying around. Terry manages to push a button on his belt, releasing an electrical shock that pushes Stalker away, and then he asks, what happens when the prey bites back? While Terry and Stalker continue to fight, Dana is running towards Wayne Manor, calling out, shouting that he needs to do something to help Terry. But before Bruce can even have a chance to respond, Dana hangs up, and he starts to stand up, telling her, she's right, I have to do something. However, before Bruce can even stand up straight, he falls back into his chair. And Matt says, wait, if you think Terry's in trouble, then that means that Terry really needs help. And if Terry needs help, where's that gonna come from? Back at the burning building, Terry and Stalker continue to exchange blow after blow. But as Stalker fires another blast from his spear, he rips a hole in the building. As the pieces begin to fall, Terry asks, what is he doing? The building is already falling apart. And Terry starts to stand back up. But as he does, Stalker knocks him to the ground again, asking, how does the suit stand up to a plasma bore? Only one way to find out. Stalker pulls back on his spear, but before he can strike, a voice tells him that he is being paid to weaken Batman, not kill him. Stalker asks Sue there and Payback tells him, it is I. The privilege of killing Batman belongs to me and me alone. Stalker then asks, you're the one paying me? And Payback knocks him aside, telling him, not anymore, you defied me. Payback cracks his electrical whip, cutting through Stalker's prosthetic legs, leaving him to burn. Terry jumps onto the ceiling, asking Bruce if he's seeing this. Why would Payback come out of the woodwork for this? Matt asks who's that guy, and Bruce tells him that Payback is a kid named Kenny Stanton. Armed with a tech-laden robotic suit, he went on a rampage. It all started when Kenny got jealous of his psychiatrist's father, paying more attention to his patients than to him. After Terry fought back against him, they thought he was getting therapy, but still, why would he be here now? Terry tells Bruce that he will get back to him on that, and he leaves off the roof and into Payback. While Payback is stunned, Starker calls out that his legs are fine and Terry quickly pats the flames out with his wings. As Payback starts to come to, Terry picks up Stalker's body and begins to make a break for the hole in the wall. Payback gets ready to crack his whip again, but before he does, he's hit in the back with an explosive. Payback then asks, who dares? And Terry says, yeah, who? Oh, definitely not who I expected. Ten? Ten, a former member of the Royal Flush Gang flies down telling him, yeah, it's been a while, thought you could use a hand. Back in the Batcave, Matt shouts that voice, that was the woman that broke into his room, who is she anyway? Bruce says that that's Melanie Walker. Her parents are king and queen, she got away from the gang and is trying to reform herself. Partly to do the right thing, partly because she has a crush on your brother. Matt says, a lady crook with a crush on Batman? Go figure. And Bruce says, it's Terry that she's interested in. She has no idea that Terry is Batman. My guess is that she thinks Terry is watching. Terry asks Ten what is she doing here, and Ten looks around and says that it doesn't look like he's got things under control here. But before she could do anything, Payback cracks his whip, grabbing Ten, tossing a small bomb, stating, I have a surprise for you, Batman. Come find me when you're ready. Ten then tries to struggle, but as she does, Payback and her start to glow and vanish, and Terry yells, He has a teleporter? And then Terry notices the bomb and says, Well, crap. Seconds later, the top of the building explodes, and both Terry and Stalker are thrown out. As the two begin to fall towards the ground, Stalker manages to wake up and reach out to grab one of Ten's flying cards. Once his cybernetic arm makes the connection, he uses it to grab onto Terry's arm, and he says that he's always paying his debts. Stalker then sets Terry onto the ground, and Terry says that it looks like he owes him one. And Stalker tells him, no, you saved me back up there, we're even now. 
But while Gotham is burning over at Payback's hideout, he watches the news feeds and says yes. These people are finally getting what they deserve. Ten asks him how could he think that people are dying, and Payback tells her good. Them and their absurd hero are responsible for making me after all. Ten lunges at Payback and he swings his arm back, throwing her down, and then teleports in a news bot, stating that Batman is about to witness what's about to happen to her. Back at the burning building, Terry helps those that he can get out of the fire, but as he goes to check on Barbara, she asks why is he glowing? Terry asks, what does she mean? And as Terry goes to respond, he's teleported away into a sealed tank filled with water. Terry quickly seals the suit, turning on the oxygen flow, but before he can even try to escape, he's hit with sonic emitters. His ears begin to ring, and Payback asks if he's even still alive in there. Good. Wouldn't want you to miss your friend's last breath. As Payback starts to choke 10, Terry calls out to Melina, and Payback asks, first day in basis? This is gonna be more fun than I expected. Terry begins to beat on the glass, and as he does, small cracks begin to form. With one final punch, he breaks breaks through causing the water and himself to flow out in front of Payback. Before he can get back up though, Payback whips the water, electrifying it, shocking Terry. Once the electricity fades, Terry begins to get back up, stating that he doesn't have to do this, and Payback throws Ten to the side, stating, Yes, I do. Terry swipes at Payback, asking why, and Payback punches him, shouting, Payback! Payback then begins to beat on Terry, yelling, This is all your fault! And young, innocent boy ended up in a place with other boys who were older than him and picked on him. His therapy was torture. Terry yells back, What happened to Kenny is the result of his old man. The kid became Payback because his father ignored him. Back in the Batcave, Bruce continues looking through the records of Kenny and learns the truth about what happened. Kenny's father was so ashamed of him after what happened that he completely turned his back on Kenny, leaving him all alone, and he never visited. Nothing. He left him to rot. So Kenny ended up doing the one thing that he thought he could as his only way out. Back in Payback's hideout, he grabs his mask, shouting, That's right! As far as I'm concerned, Batman is the one who killed my son! As Payback pulls back his mask, he reveals that he is, in fact, Kenny's father. Terry then says, wait, Kenny is... But before he could process the information, two mechanical arms reach out from the ground, latching onto his arms. Payback turns on a cannon, pointed right at Terry, telling him, For what you did, you will pay. The cannon releases a constant blast of energy into Terry's chest and begins to tear away at the suit's defenses. Batman gets up from his chair, shouting that the blast is more than Terry could take, but as he runs, he trips and falls. Matt helps him back up into his chair, telling him that if anyone's going to do anything, it's going to be him. He's watched all the old videos of him training Damien, performed all the same drills over and over again. Bruce says that he can't go out just like that. Someone will recognize him, so Matt grabs a hammer, telling him it won't be a problem. He takes the hammer, smashing one of the costume cases containing a Robin costume. Him. And he asks, uh, are you okay with this? Bruce doesn't hesitate, telling him to go. And Matt picks up everything, stating that there's one more thing to get. Once he heads into the next room, Bruce contacts him, telling him that he needs to be careful. No matter what, he will listen to every direction that he has given. Matt puts on the utility belt and the mask, telling him, don't worry, I'm ready for this. And he rockets off on the Robin hoverbike. Matt soon makes his way over to the location where Terry's signal is pinging, and Bruce tells him to fire the rockets at the power cables going into Payback's lab. A screen pops up on Matt's windshield that he says he's got it and he fires. Two rockets shoot out hitting the building and inside the power does go out, with Bruce then telling Matt that there's a generator in the back. Take that one out too, same tactic. Matt fires a second set of rockets, wishing that he had started this a long time ago, and Bruce yells, You're not there to have fun! You have to save your brother's life! Back inside of the lab, Ten uses her powers to free Terry from the mechanical arms holding him in place, and just as she does, Payback cracks his whip, destroying the device. Payback then shouts, No! You don't get to leave! Not when you're here to die! Terry then throws a battering, cutting Payback's whip, telling him, If I had known that, I would have worn my burial attire! And since I didn't... Payback yells, this can't be! And Terry walks towards him, telling him, oh yes, it's over, Stanton. Terry punches Payback away, and as he falls, Payback tells him that he's won, because he severed his lash. Fool, all you've done is ensure your fate. He takes the electrical end of the whip, connecting it to the opening in the front of his chest, and he begins to supercharge himself. Terry tries to throw a set of explosives, but Payback knocks them away, telling him, if it wasn't for you, Kenny would still be alive. I can survive what's about to come. Can Batman? A few seconds later, the entire lab explodes, and through the fire, Terry jumps at Payback, asking, You want to die? Payback punches Terry to the ground, and as he does, Ten calls out for help. But as Payback looks back, he asks, What was that supposed to do? And he grabs her by the throat. He starts to squeeze down when he hears something off in the distance getting louder, and a few moments later, Matt flies the hover bike into the building, landing right on top of Payback. Terry takes a moment to look at Matt and then shouts, How could you let him do this? Payback pushes the bike off, stating, Is that a Robin? He's no older than Kenny. This will be perfect. Payback picks Matt up by the shirt, but as Matt reaches for a battering, Payback knocks it out of his hand, telling him, You will do nothing. 
But while Payback stands in place, Terry pulls out another battering, slashing into Payback's back, cutting the power supply to a suit. As Terry gets Matt away to a safe spot, Payback shouts, Not like this! It can't end until I've paid back! Terry turns back, ripping off his mask, telling him, No, you're the one that is paying. You're paying for all the times that your son was begging for attention and you ignored him. You're the one who drove him into hopelessness, forced him into a pit of despair that was so deep that he took his own life. Now you get to live with that for the rest of your life. As Terry punches Payback, Matt motions with him shouting, SHAWAY! But then Terry turns back, grabbing him by the hood, telling him, We're leaving! Later, once Terry and Matt return to the Batcave, Terry shouts, We should have talked about this first. And Bruce says that he would have said no, and Terry yells, Yeah! It's my decision to make anyway! Bruce then tells him they can't change what happened. All that's important is what we get from this. Matt tells him, Well, that was easy. The answer's right in front of you. And they all turn to see him in the new Robin costume. Terry tells him, no, no way. Besides, there's something else that I have to do, a debt that I want to pay. Later in Stalker's Village, the doctors set him up with a pair of makeshift legs. And they say that once he's found a competent surgeon, he'll be able to walk again. Stalker tells him that not until his people find a way to eat. It's his eternal shame that he has failed them. But before long, a woman runs into the tent shouting that they have visitors. Stalker makes his way out asking who could it be, and a voice tells him that he's here to return the favor. Terry walks up with several aircrafts landing, stating that the people are starving and there's enough food here for months until they find a way to make it last longer. Stalker says they have no way of paying them, and Terry tells him it doesn't matter. You're doing what is right. Also, how about we see what we can do with your legs? As Neil Gotham sits down to tune into the nightly news of Jack Ryder and Adeline Stern, viewers learn that there's been a report of an active shooter at the police headquarters. Jack asks if there's any word on fatalities, and Adeline tells him that they're hearing that several officers and civilians are down and the shooter is still active at the present moment. Jack then says that they can only hope that Commissioner Barbara Gordon can get a handle on this crisis before anybody else gets injured. Over at the police station, she hides behind a pillar as she's being shot at, calling out to Scab, telling him to drop the weapon before he winds up dead. But the Joker's gang member Scab pulls his hostage closer, asking, Why would I drop my weapon when there's monsters flying around here? They're everywhere! He fires off a few more shots, and Barbara asks, who is he talking about? And Scab tells her, the bat! The monster bat! Barbara thinks to herself, Batman? What does he have to do with this? He's not even here. Meanwhile, over at Wayne Manor, Terry walks with Bruce, telling him that this is a mistake. No matter which way he cuts it, it's wrong. Bruce tells him that his brother will benefit because he has him to help him. As the two step outside, Terry says, don't tell me. And a second later, Matt flies by in a Robin costume, shouting, Scum this, bro! I'm flying! Bruce goes on stating that Matt is in the game, and he'll continue with or without Terry's permission. Terry yells that this is not his call. And Bruce says that they both know what he's been exposed to. It would be much safer if they supervise him, than allow him to sneak out on his own. Terry sighs, stating, okay, I realize that it would be more dangerous, but that doesn't mean that this is right. As Matt flies around over their heads, he calls out to the others that they have company. It's Melanie! Terry hurries inside as Melanie rings the doorbell, and when he opens the door, he tells her that it's nice to see her use the bell instead of breaking in. The two walk off alone, and Melanie says that she's a different person. Now, she isn't part of the Royal Flesh Gang anymore. Terry says that if she's trying to convince them, breaking into their home isn't exactly the best way to show that. Melanie looks at him and says, look, She's sorry, old habits die hard, as her sponsor would say. They haven't seen each other in a long time, and she just she just wants to start over. She's been worried about him, and he spends all of his time here, and he's not even related to Bruce Wayne. Why would he live in this empty mausoleum? Terry says that Bruce needed an assistant, and he went to work for him. That is still the case. With both of his parents gone, he and Matt are the only family that Bruce has. He also knows that she didn't come along here to ask about that. She gets close to stating that when she left the Royal Flush Gang, she was hoping that he would come after her, since they had a nice thing going, right? But he never did. Why? Terry steps back and says that he's not sure. Stuff. Life. Fear. Melanie leans in telling him, You saw me help Batman. I'm trying to prove that I've changed. But outside of the manor, Terry's current on-again, off-again girlfriend, Dana, gets out of a cab, calling Terry's phone, stating that she really hates to leave another message. But since he hasn't been picking up, she's just gonna drop by in, like, five seconds. She wants to talk because she's not sure about this whole dating Batman thing anymore. It's just too much, too weird. As she hangs up her phone, walking into the mansion, out of the corner of her eye, she sees Terry and Melanie kissing. She begins to cry, but instead of saying anything, she leaves. Just then, Matt shouts across the yard that he's sorry to interrupt kissy time, but Mr. Wayne needs you now, Terry. Terry tells Melanie that they'll talk later, and he hurries down into the Batcave, telling Bruce that this better be important. Bruce says that there's been a shootout at the police headquarters, and the one doing the shooting is Scab. Terry asks, that big oaf? He's basically a pussycat. And Bruce adds on Troublemaker, 
but not a murderer until today. Terry starts to get ready and Matt shouts, wait for me! And Terry tells him, no, you're not ready. Bruce says that he can't deny Matt this chance now and eventually he'll strike out on his own. The prototype will work as the suit until I can develop something equal to what you have. Do what older brothers do, Terry. Teach. Terry tries to think of something to say, but then he sighs, telling him, fine! And Matt begins shouting, SWAY! As the two fly out of the Batcave, Matt asks, Do you realize what this means? For the first time in forever, Batman and Robin are back, baby. Back at the police station, Scab pushes the gun to the hostage's head, telling Barbara that she works for him too. They all do. Barbara holds her gun away, stating that he's just hallucinating. Let the woman. But as Barbara starts to get closer, Scab hits her across the face with the butt of the gun, yelling, The man is the devil! Everyone in his army deserves to die! Just then, Terry calls out to Scab as he crashes through the window, and Scab yells, The bad monster is here! Oh, he'll kill us all! As Terry lands, he tells Matt to secure the area of weapons and clear out the civilian while he takes care of Scab. Scab punches Terry, telling him, I won't let you eat my soul. You're gonna die first. Matt tells Barbara that they need to get her to safety, but Barbara says that she could take care of herself, Junior. Scab runs over to his bag, pulling out a machine gun, telling himself, I need more firepower to take out the bat. Bullets begin to fly through the building, all bouncing off Terry's suit. So he grabs a battering, throwing it, knocking Scab out, stating, Thankfully, we're here. He then turns to Matt, telling him, I told you to get the people to safety, and you didn't. You could have gotten them killed. You're done. You're finished. From here on out, there will be no Robin. And meanwhile, over at Adeline Stern's apartment, she sits down for her nightly tea, and a scratchy voice tells her, You don't deserve that. Adeline drops her cup, and an image of a deformed Batman reaches out for her, telling her, The only thing that you deserve is a one-way trip to hell. The next morning, Adeline gasps as she wakes up on her floor, asking, How did she... Wait... The monster was here! The Bat Monster! She gets up asking her home AI, where is the Bat Monster? And the AI tells her that she was alone last night. No one is here but her. She says, no, that's wrong. She knows the demon was here. It came to kill her. But outside, Terry goes on patrol, telling himself that he needs to get some answers. Scab called him a monster. Why? Let's see what the other Jokers have to say about that. He spots a heist by the Jokers and he kicks in on one of them, asking, Your pal Scab went off the deep end last night. What's your game? The one thug gets up stating that they know nothing about nothing. And Harlette says that if they were there, they would have been killed too. Just like he wants the evil one. Harlette then begins to shoot at Terry and as Terry ducks, she ends up hitting one of the other thugs. Terry throws a battering at her to try and stop her, but as it knocks her down, a third thug says that he's gonna pay for that. He reaches into his coat, throwing a grenade, and as he gets closer to Terry, he smacks it away, sending it into a getaway truck. The truck explodes and Terry says, okay, you want a monster? Then it's a monster you're gonna get. Back at the mansion. Matt sees Bruce and he tells him that Terry said he can't be Robin anymore. The house AI says that he must remember. Terry is your legal guardian. And Matt yells, it's not Terry that's the problem, it's Batman. He's the freak who made the call. Someone should do something about him. Who made Batman king of the world? Bruce tells him that he needs to calm down. He can't let his emotions get the better of him. They'll figure this whole thing out. Over in the city, Jack Ryder steps out of his apartment and the valet tells him that his car is ready for him. He says that he didn't order A, but just then Melanie steps out. Maybe not, but I did. Jack laughs, stating, well, isn't this a pleasant surprise? Any special occasion? Melanie hugs him, telling him just being nice to her favorite sponsor is all. That and Terry started to come around. She told him how she felt and he was receptive. Jack tells her that's good to hear. You can tell me all about it on a ride to work. Just then Adeline arrives and yells to Jack that they really need to talk before work if possible. Jack asks what's wrong. She looks troubled. And Adeline says that last night she was visited by some awful, some monstrous, that, that, oh God, no! The shadow of Batman shoots by and Jack catches her before she falls, stating it's okay. It's only Batman's shadow. And Adeline covers her head, shouting, keep that monster away! Melanie looks up asking, monster? Over at Dana's apartment, Dana's home AI tells her that she has left her patio door open again. She asks how she didn't. But as Terry walks in, she drops her glass of water, shouting, no. Terry tells her to hang on, but Dana frantically screams for him to get out. He pulls back his mask, stating that he knows that she doesn't like him coming in that way, but they need to talk. Dana looks, asking, Terry? Oh. And Terry tells her that he got her message about breaking up with him. When Terry reaches out to her, though, she smacks his hand away, stating, the way she looks at it, you broke up with me. I saw you at the manor kissing that blonde. You're just awful. In fact, you're a demon, a hideous monster. As she looks back, Terry starts to rise and loom over her, and she shouts to her home AI, Call the cops! There's a monster in my apartment! Terry asks, Are you out of your mind? I would never hurt you. I just, I'm sorry for whatever problem I caused. He pulls down his mask and he leaves, stating, This can't be a coincidence. Something is connecting all of this. Why would people be fearful of me? As he flies over the statue of Batman, civilians and gang members alike gather around, destroying the statue, shouting, Kill the demon! Steal their souls! 
Burn him! Terry sees a little child walking toward the fire, but before he can touch it, Terry flies down, pulling him away. He hands him back to his father, and his father shouts that the freak tried to take my child. Shoot him out of the sky! The gang members all turn in the open fire. So Terry opens up his wings, taking the shots, telling the people to run while they can. When the thugs go to reload, he charges in, tackling into the group, asking, What is wrong with you? Just then, Terry is hit with a firebomb, and when he looks back, he sees the civilians are now gathering around him. He starts to back up, but as the civilians close in, they begin to beat him with whatever they can grab. The mob begins to chant, Kill, 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 until the police arrive, and a voice calls out to everyone, Please step away from the target. Barbara lands her cruiser and steps out, and she tells everyone that she wants all the civilians on the ground. Terry lets out a sigh of relief, stating it's so good to see her. These people have lost it. Barbara shouts, Civilians, down now! You're in the line of fire! And Terry says, Wait, what did you say? Crap! As the civilians spread, Barbara and her officers begin to fire at Terry. Once the blast clears, everyone swarms back around Terry as he tries to fight his way out. Barbara grabs her second gun, shouting, Monsters like you deserve to die! And Terry knocks it away, asking, What are you talking about? Someone is controlling you. Barbara's gun flies over by a doorway, and the figure inside asks, Is Batman afraid? Good, because I like that. Back at the Batcave, Bruce and Matt watch the riots, and Matt asks, What are they going to do? Can't Terry just blast his way out? Bruce tells him that they're civilians. Your brother's ability to fight is compromised. Matt scratches his head, stating, I, I guess, but what is that? That is help for Terry if he's willing. Matt picks up the new Robin costume. Bruce goes on telling him, it's a better version of the old one. Terry might not be happy about you helping, but he needs help. Now go and help Terry while I figure out why Gotham has lost its collective mind. Meanwhile, over at Adeline's apartment, Jack uses a voice scrambler to trick Adeline's home AI into allowing him in. The AI asks, should we prepare your nightly tea? And Jack says, no, I have a question. Someone came last night. Who was it? The AI tells him no one. You were alone last night, Adeline. Jack continues searching through the apartment for answers, but when he opens the door to one of the rooms, he finds a note scattered amount, all reading the bat. He picks up one of the notes stating that there's only one man who might be able to explain this. Wayne. Back at the riot, a little girl stands watching, and the shadowy figure from before tells her, There's only one way to liberate yourself from this horror. The little girl says that she's afraid, and the figure points at the gun, stating, You can free yourself with that. Use it. The little one picks up the gun, and everyone holds Terry down, and she starts to shoot. Terry pushes everyone off of him to avoid getting hit, and the little girl stands there, stating, Monster bad! Bad monster! But then a voice calls out to the little girl, telling her, Those energy cannons can roast a tank, so how about you let somebody else play with it? Meaning, me, of course. Matt uses his grappling hook to grab the gun, and Terry shouts, Robin! Bruce radios in, Remember, he's following orders this time. Matt says he's got it. Terry starts to fight back the crowds, telling him, I'm actually glad you came. Now, defensive posture only. These people aren't bad, they're being controlled. Figure in the shadow says, No, not controlled. It's fear, which we're elevating to turn them loose. Back at the bad cave, Bruce continues to work on trying to find the source of what is causing people to act out when he suddenly hears a noise. He looks back and he throws a battering and as it hits the wall, the figure says, it's nice to see you too. Bruce asks how he got in and Jack steps out telling him, the creeper has always had his ways just as he does now, even if the costume's retired. But right now I need your help. There's a young woman named Adeline Stern who's obsessed with Batman. Bruce asks, the news anchor? First name doesn't ring a bell, though, but Stern? Bruce looks at the records and says, Over 20 years ago, he crashed in on a group of gun runners. Their trades caused numerous deaths, some innocent. Their leader's name was Stern. When they fought, he ended up breaking Stern's arms. But there isn't anything during that that would connect Adeline. As the video plays, Jack says that he's not so sure. Pause and zoom in. Where did you get this footage anyway? Bruce tells him the belt camera. And Jack says, can you brighten it up a bit? As the image starts to get brighter, they begin to make out a young Adeline sitting in the corner having just watched everything happen. Jack says, there she is. Batman crippled her father right in front of her and left. No wonder she considers Batman a monster. Bruce asks, then the question is, what does that have to do with today? While the riot continues, the figure tells the little girl, there are true monsters in the world and Batman and Robin are ours. We must tear them apart, rip their limbs from their bodies, strip their flesh from their bones in order to conquer the all-consuming fear. The Scarecrow degrees that the bad demons must die. The monsters are here. For the safety of all your loved ones, kill them. Terry looks back to see the Scarecrow getting ready to charge, but Matt tells him that Bruce said to wait for a plan first. Back in the Batcave, Bruce switches back to the feed of the riot, with Jack stating that the Scarecrow was Dr. Jonathan Crane, right? Used gas to prey on folks' natural fear. 
Bruce tells him that if Adeline was exposed to Scarecrow's gas, that would explain why she fears Batman. The thing is, the census don't show any signs of gas. No unusual chemicals anywhere, yet the city is terrified of Batman. Why? Back in the city, Scarecrow shows, Yes, yes, that's the spirit! Kill them! As the crowd surround Batman and Robin, Matt says that he's got something that will get them out of this. Two small pellets pop out of his belt, and as Batman throws them down, a blue gas starts to spread. Soon everyone begins to slow down as they fall asleep, and Scarecrow yells, no, you can't do this! Terry calls out that they can, and they did. Get ready for... Scarecrow grabs the little girl asking, Do you really think so? And Scarecrow throws her off the ledge. Terry quickly runs over, jumping, telling Matt, Take care of the Scarecrow while I get the girl. Terry flies down, catching her, but as he comes back up, Matt shouts that the Scarecrow disappeared. He couldn't find him anywhere. A short while later, back at the Batcave, Terry and Matt arrive. Matt asks, Is that the guy from TV? Yeah, Jack Ryder, the news guy. Bruce says that Jack is, uh, an old friend. Jack wore a costume, did his part for the cause. Matt gets out of the bat jet asking, who was he? Hawkman? Green Lantern? And Jack walks up the stairs stating that it doesn't matter anymore. We need to focus on the Scarecrow. I want to go find my friend. It's clear that she needs help, but it's better that Batman stays far away. Over at the news station, Scarecrow walks through the hall stating, I do not like this, not at all. Batman was in the palm of my hand. That monster, that heinous abomination need to turn it up. Increase the fear. As Scarecrow goes to turn a dial on the computer, the fear inside of everyone begins to fester and grow. The rioters take to the streets searching for Batman, and as they pass by Melanie's apartment, she looks out stating that things are getting out of control. It's like everyone but her has lost it. Back at the news station, Jack runs through the sets calling out to Adeline, and then stops when he hears Adeline stating, please stop the monster, as she hides under her desk. Jack kneels down telling her that the monster doesn't exist. The Scarecrow's making her see something that isn't there. Lord knows that she has her own reasons for hating the Batman. Meanwhile, over the city, Terry flies the Batjet and Matt tells him that he doesn't get it. Mr. Wayne says the Scarecrow isn't using gas, so what could it be? Terry says that he's not sure, but they'll cover every neighborhood to make sure that they get samples. As they pass by some of the billboards, Matt says that those screens, it's kind of weird that they're blank, but it's kind of hypnotic. Just then, the jet warns Terry of an incoming particle beam. Terry flips the switch to the shield, stating that nothing can break through. But then the jet says, impact imminent, and Terry says that Matt needs to eject. As the two escape, the particle ripped through the shielding, blowing up the jet, and Terry asks, how? Getting through those shields should have been impossible. Bruce Raiders in, stating that whoever did it knew the codes to the shield's harmonics. No one would have known that unless. On a nearby building, Barbara lowers the smoking cannon, stating that the beast chariot is down. Move in. Terry calls out to Matt, asking where is he? And then Terry notices a battering flying at him. As it explodes, Matt says, he's right here! And he kicks Terry in the back. Matt shouts, I will protect this city and fight you until you're dead. The crowd begins to gather below the two of them, and they all begin to cheer and chant for Matt to kill Terry, with Terry yelling, come on, can't you see it's me? Terry catches one of Matt's kicks, but Matt uses the thrusters in his boot to blast Terry away, telling him, I won't stop until you're dead. At the news station, Jack gets up, stating that he's going to get some help. They need to find a way to stop Scarecrow from getting to her. And Adeline says, what, what is, what if I don't want it to stop? Jack looks back and asks, what do you mean? And Adeline, now wearing the Scarecrow costume, says, The child is gone! There is only Scarecrow! Back over the city, Matt tells Terry that he knows what to do, how to disable him, how to just slay the beast. Matt reaches into Terry's belt, breaking the flight controls on it. And then Terry begins to tumble down into the rioters. Matt watches as Terry gets closer to the ground, shouting that the bat demon will die. And a voice tells him that she has no idea what he's thinking. But as long as she's around, Batman lives. Terry, wearing her 10 outfit from the Royal Flush Gang, shoots by on her flying car, catching Terry before the mob can grab him and takes off. Terry looks up, asking Melanie, and she tells him, yeah, she's probably the only friend he has right now. Back at the Batcave, Bruce watches and asks how everyone is affected but her. What makes Melanie immune to the Scarecrow? If the Scarecrow is using electronics or some kind of signal, audio, visual, maybe both. Over in the city, Melanie lands on a nearby building, stating that she's pretty sure Scarecrow died. Terry says that he did must be the new model. Whatever Scarecrow is using is more powerful than before. Enough to even include Commissioner Gordon, and worse yet, the one who trashed my belt was. But before he could finish, Matt shouts, ME! And he flies in, punching Terry in the face. Back at the news station, Jack tells Adeline that he can help her, but Adeline yells that she is the Scarecrow! There's no other! No Adeline! Jack tells her, don't even try using that fear gas on me. I used to fear myself back in the day. Adeline presses the button stating that gas was yesterday. 
This is all technology now. The internet and AI receivers in every home allow me to connect to everyone. As Adeline increases the dose of fear, Jack collapses, pulling out a small device, stating that he's really hoping that Batman is getting this. Back over at the Batcave, the computer says that it's beginning to filter the signal and Bruce tells Jack to hang on. Back over in the city, Terry begs Matt to focus on his voice, remember who he really is, and Matt yells, I know exactly who you are, a monster that has to die! Matt then starts throwing all of his batterings out, landing one of them into Melanie's arm. Terry runs behind Matt, grabbing him, yelling for him to stop, and Matt uses the thrusters in the boots to blast Melanie back into a wall. Terry then lets go of Matt and hurries over to Melanie, but with his back turned, Matt throws out a small explosive device. Terry picks up Melanie to shield her, shouting that he needs to stop, and Bruce radios in that he's going to jam Scarecrow's signal, but he needs more time. But then Terry looks back, pulling off his mask, telling Matt, please just remember. And Matt stops asking, you're not a monster? And Melanie says, whoa, Terry McGinnis is Batman? Terry walks over to Matt, telling him to ignore the voices in his head, whatever he is seeing. See me! Over in the Batcave, Bruce says, of course. The AI cubes, they're everywhere. Scarecrow must have been piggybacking off of them. Melanie must not have one, which is why she's able to avoid being under Scarecrow's influence. But up above Terry and the others, Barbara leads a squad of attack jets, and as she locks on, Bruce hits the signal scrambler. Barbara gets ready to push the button, and then a voice shouts for her not to do it. Terry flies up, telling her, don't do it! If you fire, you could kill thousands! Barbara snaps out of the trance, pulling back the control, narrowly missing Terry and Matt. Bruce then appears on all of the TV screens around Neo Gotham, telling everyone, Wayne Industries detected a covert signal running into your home AI devices. It caused you all to be gripped by a blind, unreasonable fear over someone who is only there to help. As Terry flies away, Melanie tells him that he has a lot of explaining to do when they get back. And Terry says that when they're all done, he will. But we have somewhere we need to go first, over at the news station. Adeline looks at the screens, asking what is going on? What is happening? Terry crashes in the window, stating that they happened. Adeline hides behind Jack, shouting that the devil has come for them. Stop him! And Jack swings at Terry, telling him to back off. But Terry punches him, telling him, Your best years are behind you now. As Terry pulls back for another hit, Jack catches it, stating the signal is blocked, all right? But I know what drove that poor innocent child to this point of desperation. The last person that she needs to see right now is Batman. Adeline starts stumbling back, shouting to keep him away. And Jack walks over, taking off her mask, telling her it's going to be okay. The next day at Arkham, Adeline sits at her cell, stating that Batman, the demon, the devil, the monster, the beast, the Batman, the demon, the devil, the monster, the beast. And a voice comes over the cell, stating, The Batman is a monster, isn't he? When we get out, we'll be happy to deal with him. <laughs> As the sun rises over Neo Gotham, Terry McGinnis and his brother Matt, the new Robin, head out after receiving a call from Commissioner Gordon about a murder. And the two touch down, Terry asks what is the situation, and Barbara tells him something out of the norm, even for Gotham. Terry says it's hard to surprise him with all that he's seen, and as the two step into the old home, Barbara asks if he's sure about this. In a pile in the middle of the room, three dregs from the Joker gang lay cuffed, dead with the words, they deserved this, written on them. Not wanting his little brother to see this, Terry tells Matt to wait outside and make sure they, uh, have another set of eyes to watch the perimeter. As Matt leaves, Barbara Gordon then says that she really doesn't approve of this. He's too young to be a Robin. But these would be the 22nd, 3rd, and 4th Jokers to be killed this month viciously. Terry asks, there's been more? And Barbara says, yeah, just as grisly and violent. There's no definitive evidence yet, but they think it's all tied together. On a different note though, she's going to assume that she'll see them at the ceremony. Terry and Matt take off and Terry tells her, unless something comes up. So Barbara says that this is her something for the night. If she can't make it, give her regards to the boss. A short while later, at the newly built Wayne Family Center of Tomorrow, press gather around the monumental building's grand opening. Matt quietly tells Terry that they should be out there looking for whoever whacked those jokers, but Terry then says they need to be here for this. This is a big event for Bruce. This building is his legacy, a testament to all that he's done, both with and without the cape. A few moments later, Bruce's airship lands and Bruce steps out, asking, What's the latest on the dead jokers? Terry explains what Barbara told him and Bruce asks, why all this? Some insider out for revenge? A twisted vigilante who thinks that he's doing the city a favor? As Bruce turns, he sees someone and says, There, our group is now complete. Dick Grayson, the now mayor of Bloodhaven, along with his daughter, Elena, step off the train with Bruce greeting them, asking, How long's it been, Dick? 
Dick tells him, not since Elena got out of the service. But, uh, can I talk to you privately for a moment, Bruce? As everyone begins to head inside, Dick whispers that he's heard rumors of there being a new Robin. When is Bruce going to give it all up? Bruce tells him Matt's good, talented, he'll be fine. And once everyone's ready, Lucius Fox takes the podium, welcoming everyone here with them today. He tells the crowds that the Waynes have been the cornerstone of Gotham since the beginning. Bruce Wayne has generously given Neo Gotham the deed to this advanced building and with all of the latest technology to the city as a way to usher in this great new age. But before he drones on too long, please allow him to introduce the man of the hour, Bruce Wayne. The crowd claps and Bruce clears his throat as he takes the mic, telling everyone that from the beginning, my family has always been here. Generations of Waynes have helped build this town along with all of the other hardworking families. And that is why I would like to give this state of the art building to Gotham. It will house Neo Gotham's civic offices and those who work to make life better for all of you. As Bruce goes on, a man with a purple coat scoffs and leaves as he lowers his hat. However, as Bruce wraps up his speech back down on the street levels, Barbara is brought to Ace Chemicals where the Joker's bodies were found. One of the workers finds a card on the door with the words, No one uses my name, no one. Barbara stares at the card asking, Who's using whose name here? And back up top, Bruce hands over the deed to the new building. As Lucius opens up the envelope, he pulls out a letter with the words, the joke's on you, Brucey! Just then, the sound of grinding metal can be heard and everyone turns to see one of the trains to the building speeding into the station. Bruce grabs everyone, telling them, We need to go! And Terry and Matt run away so that they can change into the outfits of Batman and Robin without being seen. Once ready, Terry flies over to the train to try and stop it in its tracks, but a device planted onto the train's controls pulls the lever and the train flies off the rails. As the train begins to break apart, it crashes into Bruce's new building, causing massive damage to it in the surrounding area. The elevator Bruce and the others were on begins to fly off the tracks, and Terry and Matt swoop in to catch them before the building explodes again. Meanwhile, over at the police station, reports of the explosions flood in with Barbara running to the office to get ready to leave when she hears a familiar voice. And the voice says, Hello, Commissioner, or shall I call you Babs? Barbara gets ready to speak, but the person tells her that it's been a very long time. You age so well. I've always felt particularly close to you, like we have a special bond. You hate the Jokers as much as I do, ripping off a good man's name the way that they did. Criminal, I say. They deserved to die. Barbara finally collects her words, simply stating, You... You, Im impossible. Joker spins around on the chair, pointing his gun at Barbara, asking, Why so shocked? Are you stating that Bruce never told you that I was alive? Joker fires his gun, but as Barbara narrowly dodges the shot, he asks, Are you getting faster in your old age? Barbara grabs a drawer from the filing cabinet, throwing it at the Joker, yelling, You're the one who brought down the Wayne building! As the gun is knocked out of Joker's hand, he reaches down, grabbing it, stating, Well, I can't say you're wrong about that! Gloriously guilty as charged. Barbara then takes the miniature flag on her desk, stabbing it into the Joker's hand, kicking him in the face, knocking him out of the building. She shouts that he should never have come back, and as she looks out the window, she says, no way. Joker is standing on a hover taxi, telling her, Ta-da! Can you believe my good fortune? It's almost like someone planned it in advance! <laughs> Barbara grabs her gun and begins to shoot, but as the taxi flies away, Joker yells, too bad I'm out of range, Babs! Just look at the Wayne Building, how tragic! Back over at the Wayne Building, Terry and Matt grab a hold of the elevator with Bruce and the others in it and set it on the ground. As everyone gets out, Dick asks, Did that runaway train just take out the entire complex? And Bruce tells him, That was no accident. My building was targeted. Dick then asks, Any idea who? So Terry flies over, stating that they're gonna worry about that later. We still have to help the injured. Over on the flying taxi, Joker watches the news feeds of Terry and Matt helping the people, and he asks, Is that, be still my heart, a new Robin? How perfect! Now I've got a goal worth working towards. Something to shoot for. Shiny red and green target. Down on the ground level of the Wayne building, Terry and Matt sift through the rubble, helping get everyone trapped out as quickly as they can. As the last few survivors are pulled out, a police car speeds by, with Barbara jumping out telling Terry, You have to get Bruce. We need to talk now. Once everyone is together, Barbara tells everyone what she saw. He's alive, not some imitator, the 100% real deal Joker. Chances are that he's the one who's been killing the Jokers. All of the notes they found didn't make sense at first, but now... Bruce sighs, stating, I'm the one responsible for this. He was the one who took down the building, killed more than he can. 
Oh God. Meanwhile, elsewhere, the Joker's eyes widen as he sees what he's been looking for, stating, There you are! Tribute to the greatest moment ever! Glorious, wonderful, exhilarating, and now at long last time for the sequel! He laughs as he pulls down the crowbar from the wall that he used to beat Jason Todd to death. Later that night, a Joker's thug holds closed his trench coat, stating, I hate this, hate this, hate this, hate this, hate this, but I gotta do it, no choice. He walks into the Jokes on You magic shop with the man behind the counter stating, Hey CC, been a while. CC opens up the trench coat stating, I'm sorry for everything, but I have to do this for Ruby, so the card won't kill her. CC opens up the coat, revealing a vest of dynamite and a screen with the Joker on it. And he yells, Hello, Bertie! You supply the Jokers, the Pretenders! That's an infringement on copyright, trademark, and every standard of good taste that there is. You made them look like me. That's an insult, Bertie. One that cuts to the core. Take it away, CC. CC begins to cry as he holds up the remote, telling him, I'm sorry. And he presses the button. The entire building blows up with the Joker shouting, That would be sad, so very, very sad. But the indignity of it all. All the Jokers stealing my good name and using it for their own personal gain. Why, that is appalling, appalling, I say. They were imposters, frauds. And you know what else is a fraud? Neo-Gotham. This town should be like it used to be, gritty, grimy. Wouldn't you agree, my loyal throwbacks? In front of Joker stands five former Joker's members. Dottie, Willie, Ronnie, Ruby, and John. Joker sticks a cigar in Dottie's mouth, stating, You realize what needs to be taken back, right? Don't worry, the cigar won't explode. Uh, in theory. He lights a cigar, stating, Just one thing that's wrong, and that something is... John, you're what's wrong! <laughs> John steps back, asking, Me? And Joker grabs him by the face, telling him, I have Ronnie, a Willie, a Dottie, and a Ruby, but John doesn't fit into that! As Joker goes on, Ruby starts to cry. Joker asks, what's got you down? She tells him it's CC, he was my, my. And Joker asks, you're honeydoodles. Forget about that, you're a throwback now. Here to help take Neo Gotham back to the mud hole it was meant to be. Ruby asks, when it was plain old Gotham City? And the Joker shouts, precisely. This town used to be such a grand place. Dark, creepy, filled with muck, blood, guts, and crime. It was glorious. And now everything is new and shiny. What's up with that? And the bat, don't even get me started on the bat. He flies without a cape. He has wings, red wings, and a flying robin. Have you ever heard of such a thing? It's crazy, I say, crazy. But it certainly proves what tech can do for a man. That's why if Batman is going to embrace technology, I shall too. John here, he'll be the key to making that work. John excitedly yells, of, of course, boss. Whatever it takes, I'm here for you. Joker takes out his knife, stabbing John. No, not anymore, you're not. Later, as Terry and Matt head over to the destroyed magic store, Terry asks, what's the target? Matt tells him a novelty shop, some goofy joke stuff. Terry thinks about it and says, seems petty. The Joker is a psychotic criminal mastermind. Why mess with a low-level shop? Just then, beams fire down on the two of them, forcing them to fly up. As the two go up and over the building, they see the old Joker shooting at them. And Matt asks, Jokers? Dottie yells back, Not Jokers, we're the throwbacks. Terry throws a set of batarangs, asking, What's the difference? Ronnie tells him, It is to the boss. Might be a name only, though. Matt flies down, pulling back, causing Dottie to shoot Ronnie and laughs as he gets away. Terry then jumps down, kicking Dottie, yelling, I don't care about you, where's the Joker? Across the rooftop, Ruby runs into the building with Matt following, yelling for her to get back. Just then, Matt is punched back out, and Terry catches him asking, Did she do this? How? And Matt tells him, No, not her. Something monstrous. As he says that, Terry can hear the Joker calling out to him, stating, I can't say I love what you've done with the place. Made it all spiffy, and those wings, wings, so you can fly. Far as I'm concerned, that's cheating. But if you're going to cheat, then so will I, bats. Just that a giant cyborg John walks out, and the Joker yells, Think of him as Joker Beyond! <laughs> Joker bursts out laughing as John fires a giant destructive beam right over Terry's head. John himself begs to help, but Joker tells Batman that he has plenty of help. And did you know that it's a bird hunting season? John's arm transforms into a Gatling gun and begins to shoot, with Terry throwing himself over Matt, asking Bruce and the others if they are seeing this. 
Bruce tells him, trying to get a read now. And Joker then says, you know what I've always wanted? A grenade launcher. He shoots off a grenade, knocking Terry and Matt into the air. But as Terry recovers, he asks, you got any ideas, Bruce? Joker asks, are you talking to somebody? Bruce, 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 Bruce who? Bruce radios back telling him, John is constructed out of Promethean metal. Hit him with the heaviest artillery that you've got. Terry and Matt both throw their high explosive batterings, but John jumps up, blasting them out of the air with his eye blast. And Joker tells them, this must be some kind of joke. John then flies through the air, shooting his laser cannon, and he tears through one of Matt's wings. Terry spins around, grabbing him, but while his back is turned, John hits him with a beam, launching him across the city. Matt radios in, stating that he can land safely. All he has to do is, but just then, Matt rockets himself into a stone wall, knocking himself out. A few seconds later, Joker reaches down, grabbing Matt, stating, One man's trash is another man's treasure. So I ask you, little bird, how often does history get a chance to repeat itself? Back across town, though, Terry pulls himself out of the debris, and Bruce tells him that Matt is M.I.A. He needs to find him before. Terry hears Joker laughing as John blasts a hole into the hospital's ventilation system. Joker calls out, What a better way to help the sick and the broken than some laughing gas! Enough to fill the lungs of everyone! What better way to die than die laughing! Terry charges into John, throwing him off his feet, but John gets right back up and Joker asks, What if I was to use the gas on you? As Terry is sprayed, he tells Joker that it's kind of useless on somebody who has their own oxygen supply. Through the smoke, John lunges out, grabbing Terry, and he begins to crush him. But before it's too late, Terry reaches down, hitting the electrical discharge button on his belt, and he shocks John into letting him go. John gets up with the Joker yelling, That's cheating! But while I'm down and out, guess I should go back to filling up the hospital! Just then, a bat plane speeds by, hitting John, destroying his entire body. Terry jumps up, asking, Grayson? And Dick tells him, yeah, thought you could use a hand. As the smoke clears, Joker calls out, You're still here? Terry picks up the transmitter and Joker asks, Do you think you've won? And Terry tells him, Well, your cyborg isn't looking too good, so I'm gonna say yeah. And Joker then asks, How about your little friend here? Unfortunately, little Robbie is a bit too busy to answer, though. Aren't you, little Robbie? Speaking of friends, I've got quite a few down here on the streets. They all appreciate the good old days. So since we can't all move up to luxury palaces in the sky, how about we bring the upper crusters to them? Just like Wayne's new tower. To kick it off, I'm gonna throw a party. What I wish the Joker, that would be me of course, celebrates the most famous and greatest day in Gotham history. Complete with the blood and DNA stained commemorative crowbar. But I'm nothing but a good sport. I'll give little old Robin here a chance to keep breathing. So long as you tell me about the man you were talking to. Tell me about the man you call Bruce. As Joker cuts the feed, he says, I really miss the good old days. Good times, best in fact. Oops, almost forgot my pills. Who could forget my greatest hits though? Like the commission's daughter, Blammo, or Robin. Oh boy, Robin. Talk about a mess. Dry cleaner never could get the suit clean. Today, it's time for a comeback to prove to everyone that I wasn't a one-hit wonder. Oh, and all I would have to do is bash someone's head in. <laughs> Matt shouts that Batman is going to be here any second, so Joker grabs him by the head, looking right at him. Oh, kiddo, you're a goner. But to preserve the moment for all of history, we're going to be broadcasting it worldwide. However, before Project Skullcracker begins, this Bruce, Bruce who? Matt remains quiet and Joker tells him, Fine, I'll make you duck. Or better yet, scream! Back at the Batcave, Bruce tries to find Matt's last known signal when the Joker appears on the screen. Joker tells everyone that he's sorry for interrupting everyone's mundane programming, but he has a very special feature for all of them to see. What, you might be asking? Well, for a matter of life and death, of course. Emphasis on the death part! Joker points to a coffin with cloth draped over it, and the words Dead Bird Boy appear on it. Bruce begins to feel regret for letting Matt go out as Robin. Joker pulls Matt onto the screen and says, Last chance, kiddo! Who were you talking to over that radio? Matt tells him, My mother. So Joker lifts the crowbar above his head, telling him, If that's the way you want it, nice knowing you, Bird Boy! But before the Joker can strike, he stops and says, Wait. 
I can feel it. You're out there, aren't you, old bat? You're watching, hiding. Put the kid in the casket. Bring the lighter fluid. Bruce shouts, telling Matt, if you can hear me, cooperate. Whatever the Joker wants, tell him. Soon, the throwbacks begin to pour gas onto the coffin. And Silly says that this is so they don't end up like John. Ruby says maybe they'd be better off dealing with the bat and then the J. Willie flicks the lighter, and just as he goes to light the coffin, Terry bursts through the wall, punching them both with his fist, shouting, Leave him alone! Ronnie goes for the lighter, but before he can grab it, Dick swings in, kicking him in the back of the head. Ruby picks it up, stating that it looks like it's up to her now. Best to do what J says. Dick picks up two metal bars, cracking Dottie and Ronnie, stating that he's amazed at no matter no matter how bad the Joker treats his crew, they're always loyal to him. Terry punches Willie, telling him, and you're all just delusional. But while the two aren't looking, Ruby lights the casket and it ignites in a fiery blaze. Terry screams out, no! And he runs over, prying open the lid. When he looks inside, though, he asks, what the hell? Bruce asks, what's going on? Is Matt alive? Joker tells him, for now, but that could change. Bruce turns back, stating, it can't be. And Joker says, Sure it can, old buddy. The fact that you didn't notice the message with me in it was pre-recorded really shows your age, Batman. As Joker steps into the light, he holds a gun to Matt's head and he says, Little Robin sang like a bird. It's nice, because people like us have been friends for so long. We should be on a first name basis, huh, Bruce? Elena runs at the Joker, telling him that he's made a mistake coming for her. But Joker shoots her in the arm, telling her, You know, the commission's daughter, the mayor's daughter, you're all the same. He places the gun to the back of Matt's head, telling him, The next one goes into her brain, the second is in the boy's head. And Bruce asks, What do you want? The Joker tells him, I can't very well let Father Time do my work for me. I'm here to end things once and for all. Bruce says, have at it. And Joker throws Matt aside, yelling, Our time together is what made life worth a living for me. Joker swings the crowbar as Bruce blocks it with his cane. A second swing breaks that cane in half. Joker then cracks Bruce in the back with the crowbar and then across the face. Bruce falls down with Joker lifting it up, stating, I almost hate to do this, but there's no way that I will let nature cheat me out of this one, you old bag. Bruce gets back up, positioning his body to let the crowbar hit him across the shoulder. But while Joker thinks he's won, he gets up stabbing the broken cane into his arm. Bruce reaches into the Joker's vest, grabbing the gun, stating, This one chance is all I get. And Joker laughs. <laughs> you know what? Go ahead and do it. Do it for Babs. Do it for Robin. And so, so many more. You know you want to. <laughs> but that's when... <laughs> Joker grabs his chest, stating, My heart! Not yet! Not now! With one last gasp for air, Joker slowly releases his shirt, falling to the ground. Bruce stares at the Joker's body, and Matt runs over, stating that he's so sorry. If he hadn't talked, he wouldn't have found. But Bruce stops him, stating that he has nothing to be sorry for. He's alive, and this demented, twisted soul has told his last joke. Except Matt sees it differently. He sees the Joker has broken in and he's won. He hangs and he begs the Joker not to do it and the Joker laughs telling him, it's nice to see you use please. But years ago, I killed a Robin and tonight I'm going to do it again. Lightning strikes as Matt screams, waking from his nightmare. He pants and he looks at himself in the mirror stating that he can't let this get to him. He can't be afraid, don't ever be afraid. Down in the Batcave, Dick asks Barbara over the comms if she's got anything. And Barbara tells him that she ran all the tests, went through every record that they've had over the decades. There's no doubt that this is the Joker, and he's dead. And Dick says, after all these years, it hardly seems possible. Bruce thinks about it, and Elena asks, do you have any doubts? And Bruce tells her, did he die of some kind of heart attack? It seems wrong. Too peaceful for a monster like him. Barbara looks at the body and pushes it back into the locker, stating, as difficult as it was to comprehend, that twisted maniac is gone forever. Dick then says it's a shame that it didn't happen sooner and Bruce tells him that that's why Terry is out there making sure that they wipe out the Jokers once and for all. And just then Matt runs in asking if they're talking about Terry. He went off on some mission alone, right? Dick tells him it's nothing to worry about, just rounding up the last of the Jokers. This time of night, he should be sleeping anyway. Matt yells, the Jokers are trouble, Terry needs him. Everyone turns back to the video feed of Terry fighting the last of the Jokers. Dick says, see, nothing to worry about. Terry is just... But when he turns back, he sees Matt has already left. Dick tells Bruce that this business with him being Robin is on him. 
Wasn't Barbara and Jason enough? Not to mention the fact that the Joker almost killed his daughter. Bruce stares at the screen, stating that Matt has the stuff, he'll be fine. And a few moments later, Matt arrives at Terry's coordinates and he sees him blasting out of the building. One of the Jokers shouts not to let up, keep going. So the gang blasts Terry again, but Matt falls down, knocking everything to the ground, stating that they're not going to pull that trigger again. He picks up one of the thugs, stating that he's a murdering sicko. The man laughs, stating, idiot, don't you even know to watch your own back? Just then Matt is hit from behind and another thug says that he's right, Junior. I'm gonna keep an eye in the back of your head for this kind of stuff, but I can help you with that. The thug brings the buzzsaws closer to Matt's face, so Terry throws out batterings, knocking that thug back, and he tells Matt that he's got this. He should have stayed home. One of the thugs from before asks if they're really arguing, and Terry grabs one of the men, throwing him, telling him to shut up. The female of the group bends down, stating that she was just here for the ride. She really didn't want any part of this. And so Matt asks if she's going to surrender, and she smiles, stating for a cool guy like him, she'll go wherever he says. As she gets closer, Terry shouts for him to look out, and the woman pulls out a crowbar and begins to swing. Matt stares, frozen in place, but before the crowbar could land, a hand reaches out, catching it. Dick Grayson grabs the crowbar and knocks the woman out, telling Matt that he shouldn't be here. A few moments later, Matt snaps out of it, stating that he's sorry. And Dick kneels down, stating that he shouldn't be. The only thing that he should be worried about right now is being a kid. Later, back in the Batcave, Matt shouts that he will not stop being Robin, but Terry tells him that he froze and almost got killed. Dick says as his legal guardian, it's his call, and Bruce even agrees. And Matt asks, so what? I locked up for a second, it won't happen again. Tell him, Terry. Terry says that he knows it hurts, but Dick is right. Deep down, he knows that Robin's time has come to an end. Matt takes off the mask and Bruce looks back at the computer stating that it's done. The Jokers are finished. And Dick says, wait, whatever happened to Harley Quinn? Back at the morgue, a woman opens the locker containing the Joker's body and says that he doesn't belong here. He deserves better. Come on, I'm taking you home, puddin'. And there you have it, today's full story. I hope you guys enjoyed. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell right here on this channel, as it will only ever be receiving full stories from the other channel. And if you want to see the videos as they come out, make sure you go check out the Comic Story and Main channel, where you get five days of videos a week. I'll see you next time.